हेलो 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 चेक हेलो 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 चेक हेलो 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 चेक हेलो हेलो चेक हेलो चेक हेलो
Hello. 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 हेलो Honorable de Delhi uh, dignitaries, learned delegates, respected teachers and students, a very good morning to one and all. We, your hosts, Adil and Anushi, feel privileged to extend to you a very warm welcome to this national symposium, TROPMED 2022, Bhopal chapter, jointly hosted by IMS and ISA Bhopal. Bhopal, also known as the city of lakes, is the capital of Madhya Pradesh and one of the cleanest cities in India. The city offers a true combination of the scenic beauty of historical and modern urban planning. Bhopal and its surrounding regions are home to several cultural and checkered heritage sites, including Buddhist monks, monks at Sanchi and the rock shelter of Bimbetka, both declared World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. One can also visit the Tropic of Cancer on the way to Sanchi. Other significant attractions in and around Bhopal include Fatahgarh Fort, Lakshmi Narayan Temple and the Museum of Man and an open-air exhibit of replicas of different Indian tribal dwellings. Aysar Bhopal is a premier academic institute which was established in 2008 by the Ministry of Education, Government of India. The Earth and Environmental Science Department, EES, was established in uh, 2014 as a minor course and then as a major course in 2016. The, is to the, the, the program encourages multidisciplinary approach by integrating physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, geology and environmental sciences. It offers students a unique opportunity to build on their foundation in natural and, and, and engineering sciences to solve problems in the domain of EES. CROPMED 2022 
is a series of national conferences organized annually by the Indian Meteorological Society, IMS. The IMS was established in 1957 and is a non-profit organization that promotes the advancement and dissemination of knowledge, especially in metrology and related sciences. It has more than 3,500 life members from 100 or more research institutes, universities, user agencies, NGOs and main industries. The objective of the society are dissemination of the knowledge of such sciences, both among the scientific workers and among the public, application of metrology and allied sciences to various constructive human activities such as agriculture and land uses, irrigation and power development, navigation of sea and air, engineering and technology, medicine, public health and others. The IMS Bhopal chapter was established in 1997. The members of this, uh, the members are, ma um, are mainly from IMS and ISR Bhopal. The main objective of this chapter is to popularize meteorology and allied sciences along with their application in various human activities, mainly addressing the agricultural and water sectors. Now I, I would like to welcome Dr. Dhanya Lakshmi Pillai, Assistant Professor and Head of the Max Planck Partner Group at ISR Bhopal on the dais. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to TROPMED 22. It's my respected dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. It is, it is my pleasure to uh, receive you here in, on our ISR Bhopal campus uh, for the TROPMED 22, jointly organized by ISR Bhopal and IMS Bhopal. TROPMED, this year, we have an excellent theme that directly applies to the water and agriculture sectors. Over the next few days, we'll have an excellent opportunity to discuss and debate topics and share the knowledge related to the climate change. I'm so glad that we are join, joined by more than 300 participants across the nation this year. To kickstart our symposium, I invite our dignitaries to come on the dais and the grace the occasion. So our dignitaries include Dr. Akhilesh Gupta, Secretary Serb, Professor Shiva Umapati, our Director, Aisar Bhopal, Professor Sunil Kumar, Vice Chancellor, RGPV, Dr. Ruba Kumar Kohli, President IMS, Dr. R. Patnaik, Vice President IMS, and Dr. R. Balasubramaniam, Director, IMT Bhopal. So I invite all our dignitaries to come on the dais and the grace the occasion. So now I invite Dr. Shubhi to come on the dais to fill state. I also welcome Dr. Pankaj Kumar to come on dais. So now I invite Dr. Shubhi to, to give the bouquet to our dignitaries. So now I welcome Dr. Pankaj Kumar, convener of this meeting, for further welcome address. Thank you so much. Good morning, all, and very warm welcome. So it's very thrilled that we are seeing 
all this dropment happening again after four years of time in physical mode, fully physical mode. And uh, uh, it was overwhelming that we have received more than 600 abstracts or nearly 600 abstracts, which uh, was really very challenging for us to accommodate uh, uh, all in this uh, system. So uh, this year, the TROPMET is organized, which focuses on weather and climate predictions including applications in water, water and agriculture sector. And the climate variability naturally in, in space and time. Today's concern is the occurrence of climate change due to anthropogenic activity. And this acti uh, anthropogenic activity become much more concerned when it is integrated with non-climatic factors, you know, such as uh, unequal access to resources, poverty, environmental conditions. And this all makes the things much more uh, of concern. Uh, the challenges, these changes are manifested in the increase of temperature and extreme weather events such as floods, droughts, heat waves, severe cyclonic storms, and heavy precipitation events such as uh, which we are witnessing, such as in Pune, Bangalore, Chennai, even in Trivandrum, which was an event of uh, in the mountainous region. Now we are witnessing in, in uh, plain areas as well. These weather events are uh, need constant, uh, and these weather events need constant attention and monitoring to reduce their potential impact on society. Since observation stations are, uh, are not available at every spatial point of interest, modeling efforts are required to help to assess the simulations as well as its prediction or projections. Also, processes studies are essential to understand the phenomena in greater depth. Keeping this in mind, TROPMET 2022 will make an effort to bring together climate scientists, hydrologists, agriculture scientists, local government bodies, academics, poly, uh, policy makers, and disaster and other related experts to discuss and share their information for the benefit of society at large. Uh, with this uh, slight uh, introduction by me and Dr. Dhania, I request all dignitaries to kindly uh, uh, lighten the lamp to start the ceremony formally. Now I would like to welcome Revati on the stage for the Saraswati Vandana.
विद्यारंभम करिष्यामी सिद्ध भवतु मे Now I invite Dr. D. R. Patnaik to say a few words about IMS Society. Very good morning to all of you, respected dignitaries on the dais, Professor Sunil Kumar, Vice Chancellor, RGPB. Professor Siva Umapadi, Director Aizar Bhopal, Dr. Akhilesh Gupta, Secretary SCRB, President IMS, Dr. Rup Kumar Kohli, Convener uh, Top 22, Dr. Pankaj Kumar, all my colleagues from IMD, IATM, MOS institutions, and other universities, DST, all, and also my respected uh, fellows of IMS and also the viewer who are watching this online through YouTube. So it is great pleasure for IMS to hold this annual convention workshop after a gap of two years actually in physical mode. So there might have been some inconvenience also as uh, we are used to the online pattern. But uh, yes, we have overcome that one and we are starting this uh, physical mode to conduct this type of workshop. Giving some background about the IMS, actually it is a long history already mentioned initially by the person from uh, Bhopal chapters. But with respect to the TROPMET, actually started in 1992 in Ahmedabad. That was the first TROPMET. And uh, so now we are completing 30 years. So in the 30 years, IMS means uh, the whole idea of TROPMED means yeah, tropical metallurgy, you know it is a more important actually part, we situated in uh, tropics. So the weather is more challenging, predict, it is not highly predictable compared to middle latitudes. So a lot of research are to be done, that's why there are institute also established in the issue of tropical metallurgy. So and uh, at the same time, it is not possible for the government agency like IMD, IATM to do everything. So there is a role of the society and uh, society has a specific objective actually how to popularize the science of metallurgy also recognize the talent giving awards those who are doing contribution and also pop uh, popular lecture printing also activity wise ims lot of things there are also now because of the climate change as you know already it is well known fact the severity of weather prediction increasing and as a, as a consequence of that there is a need of weather and climate services. And we have to reach out to each sector. Now all sectors are vulnerable now because of the climate change. Our focus here is of course agriculture and water, but there are other sectors also more vulnerable. Giving one small example, this year in February or March, there was a very sudden rise in temperature. As a result of that thing, means uh, yes, rubber crops were there, but a lot of loss, huge loss were there. Simple rise in temperature in the second week of March. So that's a, the service, service is demanding, and uh, th there is stress on water sector, agriculture sector, health sector, and IMS has a role. IMS has a role, and uh, we have to work together so society can do the work easily compared to the department. So that's uh, we have invited uh, all the things here, public sector, private sector. Now they are um, coming in and sponsoring these events like energy, green energy. So we have to go for, the, we have to migrate, we have to adopt, uh, we have to adopt and we have to mitigate. So th these are the issues where IMS can handle very well. And uh, as a, this is a unique platform actually that uh, here research 
research students are there they will get exposure the experienced scientists also there we will have be hearing from them very excellent science say uh, what are the present status what are the different type of uh, work uh, research work are being done so they will be presenting plenary talks are there and also uh, the disaster managers operational forecasters so this is a combination of all gathering where we will share the, our knowledge and exchange our idea so that we will be able to provide a better services to the society to minimize the loss of life and uh, property and with this thing i just uh, wish a very successful tropmet and i thank all the bhopal chapter ims and also the all participant for making this event in, in a physical mode and wish you all the best thank you Thank you, Dr. Patnaik. So, uh, Dr. Patnaik is Vice President of IMS. Uh, now, I welcome Dr. Roop Kumar Kohli, the President of India Metallurgical Society. And to just to introduce Dr. Kohli, Dr. Kohli is uh, has served nearly 13, 14 years at WMO, World Metallurgical Organization, Geneva, in different capacities. Especially, he has. Um, his responsibilities at WMO included supporting the implementation of the World Climate Services Program, enhancing national capacities, coordinating regional and global networks of climate services, providers, user uh, license in climate sensitive sectors, and research operation linkages. He has made significant contribution to the development of regional climate centers, RCCs, and regional and national climate outlook forums across the globe while he was at the WMO. And I know he is still uh, in various committees of WMO even after retirement. Uh, sir, please. Thank you, Pankaj. Distinguished uh, dignitaries on the dais, the chief guest of this inaugural function Professor Sunil Kumar, Vice Chancellor, RGPV Bhopal. Guest of Honor, Dr. Akhilesh Gupta, Secretary, Science and Engineering Research Board. Professor Shiva Umapati, Director, ISR Bhopal. Dr. D.R. Patnaik, Vice President, IMS. Dr. Pankaj Kumar, Chairman, IMS Bhopal Chapter and Convener of TROPMET 2022. Dr. R. Bal Subramanian, Secretary, IMS Bhopal. Distinguished IMS fellows and members, participants, students, ladies and gentlemen. My warm greetings to you all on the occasion of the inauguration of this flagship annual event of the IMS. At the outset, on behalf of the National Council of IMS, I convey our deep felt gratitude to ISAR Bhopal for agreeing to host this event in this beautiful city of Bhopal and the wonderful campus of ISER in collaboration with IMS Bhopal chapter. In particular, I admire the hard work put in by ISER faculty and students for spending many late hours, late night hours, in the midst of their academic assignments to take care of each and every minute detail to make this event a grand success. <laughs> Ever since TropMed series was initiated 30 years ago, as uh, my colleague Padnaik mentioned earlier in Ahmedabad. It has become a well-established uh, event as one of the most important parts of the mythological calendar of uh, India. Interspersed by international versions of the event in the form of intromat. I gratefully acknowledge the strong support of the governments at central, state, and local levels, and also various institutions, including the private sector, in helping us to sustain the TROPMET uninterrupted over the last three, 30 years. After a gap of more than two years uh, due to the pandemic, we are now back with a face-to-face -face meeting, which I am sure will help us to reconnect with each other and enjoy a refreshing freedom from the monotony of virtual world in front of computer screens. Ladies and gentlemen, increasing societal resilience and agility to cope with the negative impacts, as well as benefit from the windows of opportunity, 
due to climate variability and change requires an understanding of climate in terms of how it behaves and how its characteristics can fluctuate and change in space and time. In addition, it also needs an understanding of the sensitivity of people and their livelihoods to weather and climate, the impacts of extreme conditions and the associated risks. Availability of useful, reliable, and timely information and the ability to act on that information contribute to improved societal resilience in the face of climate variability and the capacity to adapt to the changing climate. As the old adage goes, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. And it is imperative that we have a seamless approach to deal with weather and climate impacts on all our activities. It is therefore very apt that TROPMED 2022 chose its theme to cover advances in weather and climate project prediction and projection along with the applications in agriculture and water sectors. I'm also pleased that there is an overwhelming response to our sessions on applications of the energy sector, which attracted the attention of the private sector as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the IMS, through its nearly 4,000 members spread across about 30 local chapters and overseas, with their wide-ranging world-class expertise, is one of the best meteorological communities in the world. The IMS leadership in recent years has put in tremendous effort to enhance IMS activities, but I think there is still a lot of untapped potential in our membership, which needs our collective efforts and institutional support to be brought out into the, in the best interests of the society. As climate change and its, and its consequences to climate variability and weather extremes take center stage in global, national, and local level policy and risk management, I hope the TROPMED series will help us to take stock of our research advances, share knowledge and experiences, and raise awareness of the potential societal benefits of our, of our constantly improving capabilities. I look forward to the impressive scientific program lined up in front of us over the next four days and wish the event a great success. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this uh, uh, opening remark. And now I welcome uh, Professor Shiva Amapati, Director Aishar Bhopal. He is a laser spectroscopist and was the chair of Department of Inorganic and Physical Chemistry and a professor of instrument, instrumentation and applied physics at the ISC Bangalore. He is known for his studies of molecular dynamics using Raman spectroscopy and is a fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry and an elected fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences and also the National Academy of Sciences India. The Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, the Apex Agency of Government of India for Scientific Research awarded him Santi Swarup Bhatnagar Award uh, for Science and Technology. It is one of the highest Indian Science Award in 2004 for his contribution to chemical science. Sir, please. Good morning to all of you, uh, my friends and colleagues at the, at the dais, Ankaj and the IMS members. Uh, welcome to ISAR Bhopal. Uh, you know, it's a pleasure to see that uh, finally we are all able to get together in a room, uh, sit and have a conversation, which is much more uh, uh, you know, necessary in the modern world in terms of communication rather than just doing online because uh, you know online has never been a uh, very uh, efficient mechanism of conversation in discussions particularly and uh, so I'm glad that we are all back together. Uh, coming to the campus you will see that uh, it's about 200 acre campus uh, you would have noticed already that uh, we maintain international class uh, infrastructure uh, academic standards and research standards. And you will see a large number of students in the campus. You're welcome to go take a walk around the campus. It's extremely secured campus. Uh, uh, you may or may not notice security, but you are being monitored, <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, because, you know, we have 
almost uh, 500 to 700 women students and totally about 2,800 uh, students in the campus. In the next few days, you will also see very young people. Uh, we are like our first year's admissions are starting day after tomorrow. And so you will have about 380 students and their parents will be lugging between the main gate and the hostel. And, uh, you know, I hope it doesn't disturb your activity. But uh, it'll be crowded. So there'll be a lot of, uh, lot of running around uh, in the campus. And so uh, it'll be quite busy. Uh, but of course, uh, it shouldn't interfere with what's happening in this, in this hall. Uh, but uh, in terms of other areas, you will see a large number of people. I'm just keeping you informed so that you know why there is a crowd. Because they're coming first time. Uh, they've never been to this campus before. They're all 17, 18 year old children and they come with their parents. So everybody wants to know about the campus. They will walk around the campus to figure out what's going on. Um, and you can, you can, you know, you can be part of that uh, event of uh, inaugurating the uh, first years in the campus. Uh, so I hope you enjoy your stay in, 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 the, in the conference. Uh, particularly, I want to tell the students that one of the things we always encourage in Aysar Bhopal is that we would like students to participate in discussions more uh, in terms of any conferences that we organize. We always advise the students that this is the right time to ask the question because that's the time to learn because uh, uh, being shy uh, is only puts you at a disadvantage in terms of uh, asking the right questions and learning uh, what you don't know. Um, coming to IMS, I'm so, so glad to see that, you know, I'm not an expert in uh, 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 meteorology or uh, even atmospheric sciences, but, you know, I'm, of course, a public uh, routinely uses weather forecast. And the unfortunate thing is that I, I have to apologize. I'm not sure whether you have an Indian portal where I can download an app and monitor uh, Indian weather. I, I, I have downloaded the BBC weather and the, and the other uh, apps because, you know, we need to monitor where we are traveling and so we need to know. And I also am aware of the fact that the, our resolutions of monitoring is not at high, uh, high standards. And I think people like you uh, should probably push this to the next level uh, with the government. Because I, I can tell you one thing, being part of the uh, science and technology policy where Dr. Akhilesh Gupta was the, was the uh, coordinator of the science and technology for government of India, uh, you know, the discussions were no holds barred, you know, so there was open discussions about the evaluation of what we have achieved so far in this country, what we need to achieve in the future. And uh, there is nothing about criticism. It is about self introspection of what we have done in 20, 30 years and therefore where we should go because the demographic changes are very large. And when the demographic changes are happening, the demands of the country change. And that is something that we should take into account. So that's what we did in the, in the science and technology policy discussions. I think IMS probably should do something similar to introspect to see what have we done in the last 20, 30 years and where should we be going in the next 20 years. And you know, the, the importance of yours, uh, in addition to encouraging IMS research, IMS fellows, uh, your advice to the government is extremely important. And that has to be unbiased, open of international standards. And uh, I hope these deliberations that happen in the next three days uh, culminate into uh, some sort of a white paper of recommendations to the government, which, which then you can take it up forward and, and uh, make sure that we move into the next level. So with this, I wish you all the best. Enjoy your conference. And uh, please feel free to go around the campus and enjoy your stay. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this uh, address. And uh, one of the uh, key point for organizing this conference on the physical mode was exactly what he said, is that to make sure the students get opportunity to interact with the seniors. Otherwise, online mode, you don't get this opportunity. So you, you have good opportunity. I know a lot of students are sitting upstairs if they're listening to us. So please, please take care of this. Now, uh, I invite our guest of honor, Dr. Aklesh Gupta. Dr. Aklesh Gupta is a senior advisor at the Department of Science and Technology, TST, and recently assumed the charge of Secretary of Science and Engineering Research Board, Government of India. Dr. Gupta has, to his credit, over 200 research articles in national and international journals. 
proceedings and he is the editor of five books and author of 350 articles and nearly 100 reports. He is fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering, the Indian Meteorological Society and the Association of Agrometeorological uh, Meteorologist. Dr. Gupta currently heads the Policy Coordination and Program Management Division and it's overall in charge of five national missions of DST. Dr. Gupta has been one of the author of Indian National Action Plan of Climate Change and head of the Secretariat, which, is, which drafts India New Science, Technology and Innovation Policy, which is under construction, finalization. So welcome, sir, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Kankaj, the chief guest of today's event, Professor Sunil Kumar, the Vice Chancellor of Ajigigi, Professor Shiva Umakati, Director of Aishar Gokal, Dr. Ru Kumar Kohli, IMS President, Dr. Katnaik, Dr. Galatsubhaniyam, Dr. Kankaj Kumar, some of the very distinguished guests who are here. I must name them Dr. Kalachan Sain, Director of uh, our Body Institute, Dr. Kishi Joshi, the veteran of IMS who has so much of memory of IMS. Dr. MS Narayanan is here, Dr. Mukul Tiwari from IBM. Dr. Raj and many others who are here, I may not uh, be able to name all of them. A very good morning to everybody. Let me at the outset thank the organizers, the Indian Meteorological Society and the local chapter and Director Aishar Gokal here for having invited me to this event. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, that this is the 30th year of TROCMET. It started in 92 from Ahmedabad, and it's, this journey continued over, over the time. And uh, we had several international and national level symposiums. Also, besides TROCMET, we have several other, uh, you know, uh, uh, the e consensus and events. Uh, well, I become very uh, emotional because of my long association with IMS. I'm the only IMS li lifetime member who has been in the National Council for 12 years. Two terms as Joint Secretary, two terms as Secretary, one term as member and one term as President. These 12 years have been uh, kind of long, deep association, and in these 12 years, we organize as many as 21 events across the country, all can talk about instrument and other things. And so I recall that uh, those days of intense work that we did. But you know, Trockmet is 30 years old. But IMS is much older. IMS was set up, was established in 1966 in the Calcutta session of Indian Science Congress. So IMS is 66 years old now. And you know, when it was in 1966, 66 years old when IMS was set up, there was no metrology institution in the country, except IND. And so it is a very common phrase that you see that IMS is IND and IND is IMS. In fact, I am the first secretary outside IND. So the IMS, in fact, extended its, 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 uh, its network beyond IND only in the last 20 years or so. 
I remember when I took over as Joint Secretary of IMS, there were only 60, 620 members. And now we have 4,000 members. And most of those 600 members were metallurgists. Now you see the diversification, hydrologists, metal, uh, the geologists, the interact, the, uh, you know, disaster managers, and, and all kind of diversified, you know, members are there from IMS. So when, uh, to look at the progress in metrology has made in the last 66 years, since the 1966 year, just imagine one institution on Mitrali in 1966 and IMS was set up. And today there are 650 institutions in Mitrali where Mitrali is taught or research. Such a big expansion that has taken place in Mitrali over the time. This is the time, I think, as Dr. Umakachi mentioned, I definitely agree with him. This is the high time that we work on a national policy on metrology. Why it is required now? It is required because, let me go uh, and refer to the IPCC record that they had, the, uh, the out, the, which was out last year, the sixth IPCC record. The outcomes are very clear. Now, in the next 20 years, the temperatures are going to exceed 1.5 degrees centigrade from the present level. And that is going to change all the entire, uh, you know, kind of socioeconomic, uh, uh, it is going to make a big impact on socioeconomic. Thing. So, temperatures. There are, in fact, it is estimated that if temperature exceeds 2 degrees centigrade, it's going to be a tipping point and it's going to have serious, severe consequence on two areas, the human health and agriculture. These are the two areas going to be impacted severely. We will re exceed the limit of tolerance for the human being, temperature goes 2 degrees centigrade more. But then the bigger impact is going to be on the extreme events. Extreme events are going to be more variable, more unpredictable, more intense, more frequent, and of longer duration. India has a high population density, and we have so much of poverty. This high impact event that is going to increase over time will in fact put so much of, uh, you know, direct impact on the population. And we do not have enough adaptive capacity. And therefore, the development and adaptation will have, there's a dichotomy between development and adaptation. If you have high development, you will have more cooking capacity to adapt. India is going to face this kind of dilemma or, or the contradictions. We need to, so the role of metrology become very important. The metrology is going to be the major driver of economy in the country. And therefore, we need better system, observing system, better prediction system, better warning system. And therefore, this is the big challenge. So I'm not going to go into detail because I have my next presentation after this event, so I'll elaborate there. But what we are planning is now, in fact, the, the, the Ministry of Earth Sciences and DST join hand and we have now set up a National Climate Research Consortium. This consortium is going to address together the major uh, climate issues as, and we in fact have already set up a National Climate Research Agenda Team and uh, are many of the members of the Agenda Team here. We are going to organize a National Conclave shortly to discuss this agenda 
and as done in U.S. and other advanced countries, that this cannot, this agenda cannot be on paper. This has to go, translate into action, and we already have strategized how do we translate that the agenda that is going to be prepared will be funded by funding agencies. And therefore, this is going to be, and most of these agenda team, there are 20 team members, they are all young. We are not get anybody more than 60 years in that team. Because, you know, when I say that you have agenda 2030, so at least those who are members of this agenda team should survive up to 2030 or beyond. It cannot be people uh, generally, you know, any neutrality thing or anything. We will choose, you know, those people 70 and above. They have better wisdom. I think this is the time when we focus on young people. So we have so much planned for young people, not just at the level of uh, planners, but also at the level of beneficiary. I would uh, uh, conclude here and say that we have so much of challenges uh, to come, uh, to meet, and therefore there is a last point I would say that we need to work together. There is no option left. We have worked enough in silos. So we need to work together for the national cause and make neutrality uh, a real driver for the future economy. The, we need to build leadership. I know young people are all looking towards us, not just in terms of funding, but also in terms of plan and direction. I think we need a good direction and we need a very decisive and, and dynamic leadership in this area. I think I would end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for this highly motivational and inspirational talk. And uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Ram Kumar Giri, Secretary IMS, to um, announce some awards which we are giving from the IMS Society. And uh, I, I do hope that we have this all these awardees around. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Pankas. Now, actually, it is my pleasure uh, to announce the IMS awards at different uh, disciplines. Then, first award in this series is Young Scientist Award for the best paper publication on tropical metallurgy. So it is in the recognition of this IMS Young Scientist Award. Uh, I request uh, S. Indra Rani, please come on the stage.
Now, second award for best paper published on monsoon research. It is formerly BN Desai Award, and in this series, I will call on the stage Somya Samantapi Murugwal. Kindly come on the stage. And the third award for the best paper published on the weather and climate services. This is formerly Bhavanacharya Award. And this award goes to Rishi Kumar Gangwar and Pradeep, Pradeep Kumar Thaplial. Okay. So, uh, I will be collecting on you just, just please collect. Yeah, please. Rishi Gangwarji is collecting on behalf of him. And the last for the best paper published on climate science and climate change, Professor D. V. Bhaskara Rao Award. And this award goes to Madam Kamalji Tre and his team. She is not there on behalf of her. May I can okay, see. perfect. Okay, sorry, just uh, forgot uh, the award carry also the cash price, so that will be transferred online. Okay. <laughs> you now I'd like to request all the dignitaries to release the souvenirs come abstract book. Now for the felicitation of our dignitaries, first I would like to request Dr. Professor Siva Umapati to felicitate Dr. Akhilesh Gupta. Now I request Dr. Roop Kumar Kohli to felicitate Professor Sunil Kumar.
now i request dr dr patnaik to felicitate dr roop kumar now i request dr pankaj kumar to felicitate dr dr patnaik now i request dr sanjeev kumar jha to felicitate dr pankaj kumar Now I request Dr Sanjeev Kumar Jha to felicitate Dr R Bala Subramanian Next up, we have a short video message by Dr. M. Ravi Chandran. He is the Secretary of Ministry of Earth Sciences. He was the director at NCPOR Goa. He worked as a scientist in Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. He has also worked in National Institute of Ocean Technology in Chennai and at Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services in Hyderabad before joining NCPOR. Dr M Ravi Chandran has been selected for the MOES National Award for Excellence in Polar and Ocean Research for his contributions to the Indian Agro Project and Ocean Modeling.
Thank you. So we, we, uh, we thank him for his uh, address. We, he really wanted to be here, but unfortunately, because of some pressing things, he was not here. Uh, with, uh, with this, uh, we come to the address of our chief guest, Professor Sunil Kumar, uh, sir, from Rajiv Gandhi Pradiki Vishwishdhyale, uh, locally known as RGVP, the State University of Technology of Madhya Pradesh, India. He has also served as an additional secretary in the Department of Technical Education. He has also served as a secretary of Admi admission and fee regulatory committee, government of Madhya Pradesh. He has more than 50 research paper in various international journals. He has been instrumental in designing various social sector schemes in the field of skill development. He is one of the governing board member of NITTER Bhopal, Triple IT, and ITM University Gwalior. He is also chairman of Central Regional Subcommittee of All India Council for Technical Education, dealing with technical education of Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Gujarat. He is a member of various committees formed by the state and central government, member of various selection committees for selection of high-level key officials and accommodations. So I request you, sir, to give your uh, address. Honorable Siva Umapati Ji, Director of ICER, today's guest of honor, Dr. Avnas Gupta Ji, Dr. Patnayak, Dr. Kohli, Dr. Balasumanyam Ji, and the convener of the, this program, Dr. Pankaj Kumar Ji, and all the participants of TROPMET 2022. Looking at your serious faces, I am really sure that you are going to have some serious discussions. <laughs> that is one thing, <laughs> that is one thing I am really sure. And the reason being, <laughs> And the reason being, I remember my good old days with IIT Delhi. When my professor said me or told me that um, we are going to have one um, modeling of po air pollution at the crossings of uh, Delhi by assuming uh, rows of vehicles as a line source of pollution. And that's why you should go for uh, studying numerical methods in atmospheric sciences. I attended the course for one week and I withdrew from the whole project. <laughs> On that very day I understand, I understood that this is not my cup of tea. And this is a great reality that atmosphere is going to change. There is no doubt about that. Atmosphere or climatic conditions cannot be static at all. At least at one thing I can very sure that at Aisar Bhopal it is quite static. <laughs> and regions are quite obvious. Professor Umapati is there, so. But in the rest of the world you will feel like it that climatic condition cannot be kept static. That is against any, any, any uh, logic or any mechanics or any laws of uh, sciences. But the point of concern is that the whatever is changing, the parameters which are changing, average parameters which are changing, that should not be at such level which are not reversible. That's the point of concern. If you feel like it, there will be no cyclone, it's not possible. If you feel like there will be no excessive rains, it's not possible. If you feel like it, there will be no excessive heat, it's not possible. If you feel like it, there will be no, no excessive cold, it's not possible at all, sir. It is bound to happen. What is the point of concern that over the years uh, we have used this word like we are using our first law of thermodynamics? Do you know what is first law of thermodynamics? Uh, basically, I am a person of thermodynamics, so I know it. That is law of energy conservation also. This suggests that energy can be changed from one form to another form. It means no need to worry. The whole amount of energy is fixed. So, 
So at whatever time you want to change one energy from one form to another form, you can change it. So what's the problem with this? But as soon as you go through the second law of thermodynamics, <laughs> which talks about entropy of the universe, and which talks about the heat death of the universe, then it looks like that something serious is happening and we are not using our energy in a very sustainable way. We are using utilizing more energy which we can afford and that's why we are heading towards slow death. That's the point of concern. And as Professor Avinash Gupta was saying correctly, uh, as I have come to know that 1.5 degree temperature degree rise is bound to happen within six years. If we, 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 we are using energy at this level, then uh, this temperature rise will happen in, within six years. And uh, there is thought process that then certain things will be irreversible. So this is the point of concern. So I really appreciate the number of uh, papers which have been received under TROPMET 2022. Uh, 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 convener is saying that almost 600 papers have been received in this field. So it means a lot of things are going on in this direction. Otherwise, what happens whenever we work in isolation or in silos, uh, we feel like it, nothing is happening in the field of meteorology. But when I attend this kind of conference, then I come to know a lot of things are going on in the field of meteorology. So naturally, uh, you people are really concerned about the whole concept. And as I have come to know that um, more and more streams of sciences or engineering and technology have been merged and uh, the uh, work and the projects are, have been undertaken by uh, this society. So this is really a good sign. Reason being that no discipline can survive unless otherwise it is multidisciplinary. Because problems are of multidisciplinary nature and um, you cannot serve the purpose working in isolation. So I really appreciate this gesture of uh, Professor Avinash Guptaji, Dr. Avinash Guptaji in particular wherein he says that he's pushing that uh, person of other disciplines should also join this particular society and they should contribute in this field. And uh, naturally, uh, uh, this is my personal feeling that India as a country can contribute much more as compared to other countries in the field of uh, metrology. The reason being we, we, we feel that we are facing problems, all sorts of problems, and we have all kinds of weathers in India. So naturally, you have a live lab in India itself where you can experiment and you can do wonders for the society. I still remember the good old days, uh, almost 20, 30 years ago. When you said radio, you said that the water will rise tomorrow. We were very sure that the water will not rise And the reason being uh, that the whole dy dynamics are so so chaotic that when you predict by certain model that tomorrow rain is going to take place, it is not going to. The reason being that certain parameters be, is being missed. But recently I have seen that predictions have are quite accurate, quite fair, uh, much more, much better and um, you can rely on certain uh, predictions. But uh, in old days, uh, it was never used to be that way. And one can be very sure if you are predicting tomorrow it will rain, it is not going to rain. So, um, so Dr. Akhilesh Gupta ji, I, I was uh, telling his name wrongly. So, uh, Dr. Akhilesh Gupta ji, who, who was telling that he's a, he was a pioneer person as far as this particular society is concerned. He served this society almost for 12 years. And he was remembering the good old days when he was joint secretary, secretary, then president member and uh, with the society. And during his time, this society flourished and now there are more than 4,000 members. So at this juncture, I just wish my all best wishes to this particular society. So you people are there and I am really very happy that the way this particular society is working in that kind of work you have done you are doing and that's why we are getting much more accurate results as far as the weather predictions are concerned but one thing is very sure that issue is serious definitely but it is in our own hand actually if you will start using energy in a very rational manner earth mother mother earth is quite generous to take care of each and everyone so it's up to you in what way you treat your mother earth. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir, for this inspirational and very, with very talk, with very interesting examples. And uh, uh, we thank you again for coming and uh, ad addressing this audience. Now I uh, invite Dr. Bala Subramaniam to uh, give a vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Good morning to all. So it is my great privilege to propose the vote of thanks during the inaugural session of the Trapman 2022 uh, National Symposium. To begin with, I am extremely thankful to Professor Sunil Kumar, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Raji Gandhi, Pravdi Yogi Ki, Vishwa Vidyalaya, and then uh, who has kindly considered to grace the inaugural session, uh, function as the uh, chief guest and also addressing the August gathering. I am also highly grateful to Dr. Altesh Gupta, Secretary, Science and Education Research Board, New Delhi, for his gracious uh, consent to be the uh, guest of honor and also for addressing the or enthusiastic gathering. My sincere thanks are also due to Professor Siva Umapati, Director, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Bhopal Campus, for addressing the delegates and grant, uh, granting necessary permission to host this event in the sprawling campus. Dr. Rupakumar Rup Rup Kohli, President, Indian Meteorological Society and former Chief, World, Meteor World Climate Applications and Services Division, WMO, has been a multifaceted uh, visited uh, personality. And I am sure that Indian Meteorological so Society will flourish uh, uh, further under his presidentship. I am highly thankful to him for his address. <laughs> Interaction with these uh, distinguished personalities prior to this day have helped us to define the event in its present form and have given us the necessary encouragement uh, for the entire course of action. I am also thankful to Dr. M. Mahapatra, Director General of Meteorology, IMD, and then Dr. M. Ravichandran for their address, Secretary, uh, Minister of Earth Sciences, for their support on granting necessary permission to host, to organize this uh, TROPMED 2022 National Symposium. Sincere thanks are also due to Drs. Pankaj Kumar, convener of uh, TROPMED 2022, and Dr. D.R. Patnaik, Vice President, Indian Metallical Society, for welcoming and addressing the delegates. Dignitaries and experts, to name a few, Dr. P.C. Joshi, sir, Dr. Ravin Anjandia, sir, Dr. M Dr. Nikul, and then Dr. Vikas Sagal, and, uh, and also speakers of various sessions who have gathered here from across the country amidst difficulties and uh, inclement weather. My heartfelt gratitude goes to them. I am thankful to the faculties of ISER, scientists and officers from various MOES organizations, ICAR, and various universities for taking part in the TROPMED who make the event successful. The local organizing committee, particularly just my sincere thanks goes to the student force who have toiled round the clock for each and every aspect and made us comfortable to attend the event. Deep sense of gratitude is due to them. I am also thankful to the media friends for taking part in the event and for their wider coverage. So I thank every member of this audience present here for this inaugural ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Jai Hain. So before we break for, uh, for a high tea outside, I just have one or two quick uh, announcement, which I will just uh, read for the audience so that uh, we know how this uh, workshop is going to be conducted in the next four days. So um, the most important point usually you ask for is Wi-Fi, food, and lodging, etc. This all will be uh, information you will get on the help desk. For the next four days, we have planned very interesting plenary, keynote, invited lectures, as well as oral and lightning talks. Lightning talks usually for two, three minutes. The good poster which we have selected to demonstrate by the participants to the audience so that they, you force them to go and look at their posters, to your posters. Then poster presentations, this will be done outside. We have a very nice uh, garden outside where this poster presentation as well as the um, lunch and dinner will be served. Uh, all these uh, uh, 
sessions are organized in different parallel sessions in three different halls. One is this auditorium and then hall one and hall two on the first floor. And some sessions in one or two boardrooms, but that will be a very small gathering for um, sh short group of people for some discussions. We have made arrangement for the lunch and dinner for all, day, for all four days in the VH, and breakfast will be served into your respective guest houses. If you, are, if you have still not registered, you can do, and also um, you can do it online also, there's a provision we have. There are student volunteers present around. You can contact them for any queries, concern, or help. So immediately after this tea break, we will be uh, resuming in the same hall for the um, plenary talk, which will be given by Dr. Aklesh Gupta, sir. And this uh, session will be chaired by Dr. Kalachin uh, Sen, sir. So I also, just to mention that we have uh, some other dignitaries who are sitting in the hall, Dr. Uh, R. Krishnan sir, director of IITM, thankful to uh, Joshi Saab already I, uh, for being here, Sain sir, and many more around to make this event successful. I know there are so many dignitaries who are coming who could not make to this event on this particular day. Maybe the secretary Saab will also come, and the ISRO SAC director, space application director, will also be one of the dignitaries. He will be speaking, giving plenary talk on 2nd December. and. Um, there are two, three more senior uh, colleagues who will be coming and speaking around. So it is really going to, we have Dr. Rajiv Mahajan Saab also from a CRBC, Advisor Government of India. So we will be having a lot of people, senior colleagues, which especially I am talking to students right now, that you should try to interact with these people and, and express yourselves and, and introduce yourself. So with this, I, I thank you all again, and uh, we break for this session, and uh, I invite you all for a high tea outside. So just, just one, sorry, with this one announcement, please. So all the participants are requested to submit their presentations to the following email ID with the following format. Yes, so uh, th thank you, sir, for uh, reminding me. So we, we stand for national anthem before we disperse.
हेलो 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 हम्म क्या आपके पास कितने पॉइंटर है हेलो 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 भाई भाव भाई भाव अभी जाकर पीछे बोलो सहवाज अभी यहाँ लगा चलो मैं अभी ऑडिटोरियम में हूँ तो एक काम कर वहाँ लॉन से बोल लिया एक रिफ्रेश लॉन में रिफ्रेश में सुन डब्बा लिया एक मिनट हेलो 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 आप लोगों का आ रहा है मतलब पीछे हाँ हल्का हल्का आ रहा है इधर हेलो 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 ठीक है अब
वी विल बी स्टार्टिंग विद द प्लेनरी सेशन सून सो काइंडली बी सीटेड
we will now begin with the first plenary talk of the day so f i would like to invite the chair dr kalachand sen who is a director of vadia institute of himalayan geology on the dais a very good morning all of us are eagerly waiting to listen to dr akhilesh gupta ji who is the secretary acrb as well as senior advisor to department of science and technology government of india i know him personally since long and you also have seen him a very dynamic enthusiastic and pro scientist human being and under his leadership and guidance a lot of programs and initiatives are there into the acrb many of you must have submitted your programs proposals and he looks forward the young people young scientists researcher faculties so that they can come up to address some of the societal challenges provide some sort of solutions what country is looking for for the disaster resilient climate adaptable future so i'll not take much time may i request dr akhilesh gupta ji to share his thoughts views on very important topic today we have chosen and he will be talking on climate research in india this and 2030 and beyond dr gupta ji Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kalachan. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, I think uh, the uh, introduction to my talk I have already given in the morning session, and uh, so I will build upon what I said in the morning. Uh, this, the motivation for this, came from the fact. that this is we are india is now at a crucial juncture where we need to upskill climate research and how do we do it what kind of issues are there and how do we bring institutions and individuals together is the idea behind this talk i am not an active scientist today so please bear with me because i am now last one and a half decade i have been working at lee at the policy level but this is a very unique opportunity when you turn from researcher to an administrator then you know the nuances of all sector and that's why i always say and as dr kalachan mentioned that my focus has always been the young people now let me see that india in fact when we ipcc started you know first assessment report in 1990 to the hit assessment and also the sixth now and so we have been taking initiative at the national level to various way i mean whether it is uh, uh, it is the uh, the field experiment or the taking a research uh, initiative all that you see you know in different stages of uh, you know uh, in every uh, assessment report we have responded to uh, this thing in fact uh, both in this ministry of earth sciences and dst have been in fact initiating uh, research uh, uh, programs in their own way i'm not going to elaborate but i am since this is the uh, action that dst has taken i am since i was heading these two mission i will elaborate a bit on this thing so when in, in fact this is an interesting co <coughs> coincidence that when the uh, the third assess, uh, 
uh, the third assess court assessment report came in 2007, and there was a committee at the national level, uh, the INTAC committee or cabinet uh, headed by Prime Minister decided to have a national action plan on climate change. And I happened to be, at that time, advisor to Minister of Science and Technology. People believe that climate change is the subject being driven by the Ministry of Environment and Forest. But the national action plan was drafted by Office of Minister of Science and Technology. This is a unique kind of thing. And then, and this has occurred in, un, in, in very record time, we had launched eight national nations. Two of them were you know, uh, given to DST. And it came to DST at a very crucial point. When DST, Ministry of Earth Sciences was formed in 2006, and DST had given everything to Ministry of Earth Sciences, including IND, NCLLOC, IATM, all initiatives. And DST was left with no institution of its own. And then, at that time, you were supposed to coordinate. And so I was the only with largest in the entire DST. And I also, won, you know, kind of having you know, the Ministry of Science, Earth Sciences Secretary was asking me to come to Earth Science. But somehow I remained. So you know, you know that uh, the famous movie where somebody comes from the other planet and remains here, doesn't go back. So I am the person who remained in the GST, did not go back to Earth Science. Anyway, so these are several uh, initiatives that we took in the last uh, one decade. Uh, the goal the missions, under two missions, a large number of network of institutions were supported. Uh, and see, these are all central excellence that they supported in diverse areas of science, major R&D programs, network programs, and, and so on. So this is the kind of, if you look at, and we also set up the state's climate change centers. In fact, uh, Lokain Thakkar is here, one of the centers is here in, in uh, the government environment here in Gokal. So we set up something like 25 state climate change centers. So this is the, the summary that you know, we supported 170, 360 institutions, 1400 scientists. By the way, this is the, the statement that I gave in the morning. We have 650 institutions in the country working in the area of climate and related areas, teaching and research. And you know how many scientists? 4,000 plus scientists in the country, nearly 1,800 students uh, in the research area, they work for This is a huge network that we have. And we, in fact, targeted that you will be able to, by the end of this mission, will be able to uh, support almost every uh, individual really part of it and every institution in the country. Now, some of the important uh, outcomes that I just see, we did, uh, this is the, now, you can say the vulnerability assessment has been done by many states, many, and this is, what is new about it? This is a very different vulnerability assessment that we did. This is based on AR5 definition. So earlier, the uh, vulnerability as definitions were different. We used that and did this uh, vulnerability for 29 states of the country and 690 districts of the country. And this is a result that shows that Jharkhand is the most vulnerable uh, you know, state. Uh, and there are eight vulnerable states that in Jharkhand, Mizoram, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, Assam, Bihar, Arunachal, and West Bengal. This is the entire eastern belt. And incidentally, or coincidentally, these states where the vulnerability is high uh, are also the poor, poor state where the GDP is low and poverty is high. This is a district level. You can entire this box, you can see, is highly vulnerable to climate change. Now, this is the work that uh, uh, one of our PIs had done. That you know, due to uh, good uh, you know uh, uh, literacy and conversion rates of marginalized group in the country, uh, and also decrease in the child population uh, due to better birth control, the social vulnerability is decreasing. Physical vulnerability is increasing, but social vulnerability is actually decreasing. 
this is the this is the kind of contradiction that we will face where you know we need to work as a society to see that when the climate change increases the, the physical vulnerability will increase whereas the greater development social vulnerability will increase now we in fact our uh, the national mission for himalayan ecosystem dr kalachand is here who is leading the center of glaciology at uh, wadia institute we did a lot of work in glaciology and you remember those ipcc third report where the glaciology has been very uh, badly portrayed by uh, you know ipcc report where it says that you no know, some of the uh, uh, like uh, uh, the especially some of the glacier like gangotri glaciers are like to vanish in few years we there after in fact dst uh, had worked very extensively with the institution created a network serb in fact work on a glaciology enc and a lot of work has been done in this area now we have clarity as to what uh, what is the glaci glaciology research in the country so look at the see on an average putting all put together this is the there is no doubt that glaciers are retreating no doubt nobody can deny that glaciers are retreating across the himalayan range the glaciers are retreating and the average rate of retreat is 5 to 20 meter per year this is the rate of but there is nothing abnormal trend in recent years in fact there was in between time when the there was the some of the glacier like gangotri glacier had receded very fast but now it got stabilized the glaciers are losing mass at the rate of 6.5 6 gigaton per annum which is 0.2 percent per year what what is important is that the large glaciers with uh, the area more than 10 km square are less getting less impacted compared to the small glaciers where the area is less than, and this is the statistics so nearly 66% of the total number of glaciers have area less than 1 km square and they occupy but they occupy only 4% of the total volume uh, total area and 12% of the ice volume so please understand that don't go by number uh, these this is the, the and it is just 3% of the total number that have area more than 10 km square got this occupies 65% of the ice and 45% of the area now this is the kind of data that we get so although glaciers are receding receding numbers in fact like many of the glaciers are 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 vanishing and there is some kind of uh, uh, glaciers are joining so fragmentation and joining taking place but then uh, these are mostly happening for the small glaciers a large glaciers this uh, the trend is very different now this another study that we took up as a part of the mission is the aerosol study and here the, the, the really clearly shows that we have you know, a lot of good results and one of the results is that in the high aerosol build up you know uh, during dry spell makes dry spell drier and following wet spell becomes wetter this is you can understand the loading uh, uh, the the uh, and the aerosol loading that is taking place is making so much of variability in terms of uh, rainfall uh, aerosol cloud incidence also i think this is a uh, known property the aerosol cloud interaction taking place over the indian region and uh, we see that you know this kind of uh, the soluble organic aerosol and, and uh, is making a uh, lot of uh, you know impact on the non conductive system and also show uh, negative aci over the continental region the uh, this is the data that our people at the uh, our bhu center has done that you can see that the the uh, daily uh, diurnal diurnal temperature range is actually decreasing uh, over most of the country or more so 
in the in the uh, in some of the area like northeast and central India, where the dialogue change is taking. Well, and that is understand that the trend in the temperature is that minimum temperature is rising faster than the maximum temperature, and therefore the uh, range is decreasing. Now this is the work that is needed from the point of view. The entire world is now saying that if if the uh, uh, temperature increases beyond the limit, what is the option to the world? So the policy people are debating that we must have two options available to us. One is the carbon removal, and the other one is the, is the geoengineering. And these two, so in DST had work on these two very extensively. Our people in ISC Gangalore work and seen that what is impact of injecting the aerosol at the stratosphere to geoengineering. And then we see that, you know, it's very interesting. So, impact on ITCG is that, you know, the ITCG sit to the, to the other hemisphere once you inject in this area. So this is interesting, showing that the convections are going to be impacted seriously. Uh, in when you are going to inject the aerosol at the stratosphere end. Also, the monsoon rainfall, again showing that in the, it, is in, it is increasing, in, decreasing on the, in the hemisphere of injection and the increasing in the other hemisphere. So this is another uh, kind of uh, data shows that geoengineering need to be carefully used for the country. Uh, uh, see, same thing is the regional impact on monsoon in the uh, other thing. Of course, this is mostly in the RCK 8.5 scenario. Uh, also, it's showing that there is going to be persistent doubt over India if we use the, uh, the uh, aerosol injection in the hemisphere in that particular so That's a bad thing. So, you know, uh, why I am showing this? that when this, uh, the, the issue of uh, whether the world can use uh, in the worst scenario uh, this geoengineering, what impact it will have on India. Uh, in the rest of the world, the impact is not very clearly seen. But in Indian region, three things are going to be impacted. The convection is going to decrease, the monsoon is going to have so much impact, and also the general rainfall, overall rainfall is going to decrease over the country. Uh, of course, many studies have been done. This is the one study I want to mention, just published in science. Uh, we have, you know, that Alino droughts and non Alino uh, floods. You know, these are all known, uh, that's the thing. But we have, you know, that we have droughts during El Nino, non El Nino, and also uh, 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 drought during El Nino. Both are important. So this is a so this is a study that is given. Drought in non El Nino, and uh, uh, and also drought in El Nino. So all this, if you this study has been done by Venu and others, and is saying that. In the El Nino drought, you know, the pattern of rainfall is very different from the El Nino drought. Uh, they, these are like, you know, uh, the two diverse kind of uh, uh, issues that we discuss. So, how the buildup of rainfall takes place from the June to September uh, in the, is very different in these two conditions. Now, coming to uh, the, the key issue that when the sixth report of assessment came, you know, as I mentioned in the morning, we have uh, the, the next 20 years going to be very important, but then temperature, if nothing major is done in terms of emission reduction, going to exceed 1.5 degrees centigrade. And if it exceeds 2 degrees centigrade, then heat extreme would reach a critical tolerance limit. Uh, and that is, uh, and especially for agricultural health, uh, especially 
uh, the, uh, the Ravi is going to be impacted severely, if not Kharib, uh, in the agriculture. But overall agriculture is going to be, to be impacted, although there is going to be greater uh, uh, agriculture greening take place, but then uh, that will uh, be offset by the temperature rise. And the health is a, one area where you reach a limit where the humans cannot tolerate uh, that temperature. More rainfall, more associated, this is all known that you know we are going to have in future, but some of them will reach a limit where it will be very difficult to be. Now there is going to be serious food, water, energy and health security in the future. Country of this size with so much of diversity and so much of agriculture uh, gradient, we will have issues related to all these areas in future and therefore the need, we need to have a strategy to address uh, these insecurities. Uh, this is the AR6 uh, uh, major uh, deviations on the earlier thing that the interdependence of climate, ecosystem and biodiversity and human society. So therefore the impact of climate change and, and interlinkage of climate change with the social issues uh, are the one. So therefore, the all non-climatic global trends in terms of biodiversity loss, overall unsustainable consumption of natural resources, land and ecosystem degradation, organization, all these are the new areas that we need to address. Now, I think you mentioned in the morning that this is the first time that DST and MOES had joined hands uh, and set up a national uh, consortium uh, on climate research. And the idea is that, you know, our sciences does, does most of the research intramural. IATM, Nishan Allah, Andy are the intramural research institutions where the funding is done by the government direct to the institution. But the larger community outside these three institutions remain unaddressed and unsupported. And that is where DST can pitch in. So DST and MOES put together can cover the entire range of institutions in the country. So this is the idea that we thought that let these two ministries, the government, work together and address jointly all the research issues. In fact, so we set up a national climate research agenda for 2030 and beyond. This is the why agenda? Because we need to take the climate research into the future uh, of you know how we address this thing in future. And this is the dynamic uh, issue, time when we have so much of you know uh, issues. Now what we did, as I said, as I said in the morning, uh, normally when you ask, uh, you know, when Dr. Ravi Chandan and myself we discuss uh, what to, how to do, how do we set up this agenda team, then uh, Dr. Ravi Chandan was suggesting that you know we should work with young people. So it was his suggestion, we set up a young team for drafting this national agenda. Look at, uh, so that I'll come. So these are the seven areas that have been identified as major climate research areas for the India. Climate modeling, monsoon, extinct events, aerosol, urban climate, glaciology, and the Himalayan ecosystem area. These seven areas cover the entire gamut of climate research issues in the country. Now, this is the team that I see. This is the team that so this is a team that was set up. In fact, uh, Krishnan also is here. So Krishnan co-chair this agenda team. Uh, Suvimal Ghosh is the convener, and these are the uh, seventeen people. They and if you look at each of them, they are all young people. They are in uh, 50s or in the, uh, and the oldest of all. So all entire people and so we wanted to have a young team so that it works. I'm happy many of uh, are here. Uh, Vival is going to attend tomorrow. Sunit is here. 
then we have uh, uh, Sandeep coming uh, to Kati, I don't know, uh, and then Saha is here, Pankaj Kumar is here, so many of uh, they are part of this kind of team. This is the task that we have, we have to finish this uh, by end of December, this is the going to be some halfway, we are halfway, almost uh, three rounds of discussions have already taken place. But I think we are going to have two more rounds and then finalize this work. Now let me come to what are the major elements of this agenda. The agenda 2030 and beyond. Now look at the climate modeling side. What challenges we have? We have the issue of process understanding. I think we need to have a much deeper understanding of processes in climate system than what we have. This area is very important. India centric in specific modeling and regional human component. Now, see, the, uh, in, the, this area is, uh, you know that all of us say that we need India specific model. But connected issue is regional human component. See, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, land surface processes that we have. I am going to come next and you will see is uh, in India going to is very different from this the kind of model that we have in the international level and therefore we need to address this issue about uh, the, the renal human component or anything. Another area of concern is the high resolution modeling and in India we do not have uh, the uh, uh, the high resolution modeling, many uh, uh, researchers working in this area. Uh, also, we have issue over, the, so the modeling will have issue over resolution, this impact and decision tools based on AI enable. Also, the huge computing requirement because of the high resolution modeling uh, or uh, 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 the, the kind of uh, uh, subgrid process uh, and subgrid level resolution uh, modeling and also the uh, the expertise that we have right now uh, is, is very very limited in this scene. So what we need is not just modeling but also we need interdisciplinary knowledge of climate and impact protection. Now, this is an area that we need uh, really a lot of work and then decision support system based on uh, decision tool development based on the AI ML and uh, through quantitative uh, framework we need to develop, uh, have reduced climate risk and this is the ultimate goal of the climate, uh, reduce climate risk and improve climate resilience in the country. So the whole lot of issues are there in, into this climate modeling issue. So in fact, we have been uh, talking about the science and adaptation connect and there is a feedback. So all that we have uh, in terms of science have a direct uh, relevance and, and relation to the adaptation, adaptation area. Whether it is agriculture, water, disaster, health, coastal, infrastructure and all these areas are also climate services areas. Uh, so basically you are talking about climate science processes uh, leading to application and then finally uh, giving services. So and all that gets feedback into each other. This is a diagram showing how, connect, how climate science areas are interconnected. Now look at this. We have four broad processes, monsoon processes, aerosol climate interaction process, ocean processes, and land processes, all converging at modeling level. And look at the, the kind of uh, work that we needed. So, you know, on the land processes, we need to have better understanding and concentration of carbon uptake and emission, both on the agriculture and forestry, uh, carbon cycle and water cycle interconnection and relation, also, hydrology and cryosphere uh, working with them. And then in the climate modeling side, we 
have neural and as I mentioned high resolution modeling and this direct numerical simulation issues uh, they in fact work at the uh, for example for the urban climate modeling and multi resolution modeling they will work together uh, at this end and this is the computer intensive area where we need a lot of uh, you know computational resources and this thing. And of course, AI enable working for the decision tools. Uh, because when you are going to work for the application, we knew you need this AI ML in a big way. Now, we have been working for GCM, all land, surface, atmosphere, uh, land, uh, uh, ocean, atmosphere. So this is the this is the work that has been done extensively, and most of us use GCM. Uh, you know whether at all levels and therefore this is the kind of thing that we have been working and have good experience. We now need to work on ESM in a big way. Of course, uh, IATM has Dr. Krishnan is here. They are already working on our system model. I think we need a much more comprehensive and much more India-centric uh, ESM where you know the climate and biochemical class cycles are uh, truly integrated through uh, various cycles, carbon cycle, nit nitrogen cycle, and also uh, with entire uh, climate and human activity need to be integrated. This will need a lot of other work. In fact, what we are uh, planning, in fact, I think also have been thinking to set up, but this is the work as part of this climate agenda we will going to do is set is set up as India-centric community system model system, where you know all those who are interested across the country can join and work for the community system model system. This will really make a transformational change because two ways it will help. One is the capacity building in the ESM, but the more importantly that you will have uh, access to uh, global system to a, uh, a supercomputing grid that we propose to set up. Now, this is the interaction. Uh, the, the aerosol private interactions are very interesting. And they work at a different level. See, when you are trying to limit climate change, we uh, focus on reducing uh, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, and all anything. And this is definitely reduction of this will benefit climate. But when you are working on air quality, you try to reduce some of these areas like nitrogen, the uh, organic uh, uh, the organic carbon, the, the sulfates and all. But that is going to put penalty on climate change. And therefore, the, the compromise between the climate benefit process to the climate penalty process is very important. Therefore, you need to address both the issues. India is going to face uh, 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 air quality issue in a big way. Already all cities are facing those issues of air pollution and all. How do we create a compromise between climate process and the uh, aerosol or the uh, issues of air quality? This is a big issue and the kind of interaction that you see the climate system changes uh, with along with the radiative cross forcing and atmospheric uh, changes that is taking place because of uh, air quality, all these are going to work with the entire ecosystem of anthropogenic and natural uh, climate change. And this is an area that we need a big work on the uh, on this uh, research area. So this the aerosol is going to be the biggest one of the biggest area of research in the country. Again, let me mention here that, you know, in the aerosol area, there are nine ministries working in the government of India. Earth Sciences working, ISRO working, DST working, agriculture working, uh, environment working. There is a need to work together. So what we are proposing as far as the consortium, one single mission on aerosol. Put together everybody. All everybody should join and work for one mission. 
and we shouldn't, cannot have these working in isolation. Now, Heidelbergian cluster, of course, models have been uh, integrating these things, and especially uh, the uh, recent some of the development is in this area. I think we need much more holistic, and this is a very complex water cycle process where human and natural system they interact. Uh, we made good progress in the land surface modeling in the 70s to now we have so much of development and so much of land uh, representation, that process representations have taken place. But what is now required is developing an India-specific modeling where we need to integrate glacier component, water management and crop calendar practices, groundwater, in fact, the, uh, if you see the groundwater in the, in the presentation in the global uh, scenario, there is in India, there is a lateral flow of groundwater, it is not there as part of the recognition. The gig, one gig area is soil moisture, although I think a lot of work has been done, in fact, Guyan Mishra did soil moisture uh, estimation, uh, but what we need is validation. So soil moisture needs to be validated. We don't have a single network of soil moisture in the country. We need a, a good network of soil moisture stations uh, and not just surface moisture, that is satellite estimates surface moisture. I think we need uh, the, uh, the better and deeper thing. Uh, and therefore, a uh, lot of land, so this is the gray area for our present earth system model also. We need to improve a system model with these components and especially the India-centric, some of these areas. Now, carbon cycle is a very big uh, new concept. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's already, so ocean, land, and atmosphere, how the carbon feedback takes place among them. So between the ocean and the atmosphere and between the land and atmosphere, the kind of processes that take place is very, so, in fact, this is the important. India has, in fact, after China, has become the, the biggest, you know, uh, uh, global greening taking place in India. And the two areas of global greening, one is the, because of the large in agricultural intensification that is taking place. So this, uh, so carbon, in fact, CO2 fertilization is the main driver. So whatever instrumental changes that you see is going to in fact increase the water uh, efficiency and CO2 fertilization taking place. And therefore, the greening uh, part in fact is in fact is working uh, to, miti to, to mitigate the uh, 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 emission and also it, it actually uh, working to enhancement of carbon intake and evaporative cooling at the agriculture. So China is the first and India is the second country to have this thing. And therefore, many things are there, the key issues, national level vegetation productivity data, carbon uptake potential of forestry and agriculture, carbon and water cycle interconnect, and uh, the Indian vegetation carbon uptake. Uh, these are some of the areas of research that are going to come as a part of the carbon cycle. The, now, the ultimate goal of, carbon, uh, of, of the climate modeling is what? See, you do a lot of good things, work on the modeling part, everything, product is created, uh, but then where it goes? It goes to the ultimate user, say, farmers. And therefore, and for the farmers, what they need? They need district level advisory. Now, you can say that agricultural advisory is already there. Uh, uh, and he is doing. I think that we need to uh, supplement with a lot of other information. These are not given right now to the farmers. And that, and when we talk about the farmers, we are talking one end only as the user. But connected with that is many ends. We need climate, all these people to work together. Climate modeler, data scientists, government official, NGOs, farmers, social scientists, agronomists, and hydrologists to work together. Although there are committees 
uh, to work. I think we need much more in, inclusive and integrate uh, interaction than what we have. And therefore, the, uh, the solution approach uh, that we currently have need to be uh, up with skill. And that we need a lot of work on this front. So the user end is still a gray area for us, although we work so much for that. As I said, AI ML to climate science is going to be future of, future of uh, our research. So theory-guided data science models work at the intersection of physical models, machine intelligence, and high-performing computing. This goes as possibility framework and decision models are developed to create uh, decisions by the uh, uh, you know, policy makers. And this is the entire system that we need to develop. So scientists have worked up to this level. We need to work beyond that. Uh, so this is the area of research that we need to work. Now, this is a changing definition of climate risk. We had, as I said earlier, only hazard connected with the risk. We used to think that risk is the cause of the hazard. But then the AR4 said that no, it is vulnerability, uh, the uh, hazard, and the exposure, all three are you know, important, and the risk is at the intersection of these three. Now in the AR6, we added the response system. So you, you can think of, so all that, you know, this fourth dimension of risk is added to the, uh, in the AR6 system where I'll give you examples, say, uh, Andy says the cyclone forecasting has improved. No doubt, it has improved. What, what kind of response is as generated? It actually impacted uh, one thing, very uh, big way, that your higher accuracy and better warning has led to reduction in number of deaths. That's a, so the response of the community is that a cyclone, incoming cyclone, not to worry, just get prepared, because you have achieved the level where accuracy of the forecast has increased, so the number of deaths are going to be very less. That is a system that you need to develop, create, impact forecasting, uh, and develop response based on that. I, this is my last slide, you know. So I talked about the climate. Now this is the last slide showing the vision for the weather modeling, weather forecasting. Now you see, this is the vision that National Weather Service USA has prepared for 2030. And these are all statements. We don't know how much it will work. They will work on it. Satellite observation will tactically replace all instrumental observation, which means there will be no need for any instrument observation. These are all statements. I'm not agreeing with this. Because as a mythologist, we should contest. So I'm not saying this is vision for India. This is the National Weather Service. And they are saying mythological dependence on Synastic others will become obsolete. So practically, you don't need any observation. You don't need any Argus uh, observation. And satellite will give you everything. And the assimilation, they are saying, it will become near perfect. So that your analysis will be, uh, you know, like your observation. So analysis, observation will, will become, uh, you know, similar. And global model to run uh, for 30 days, less than one kilometer horizontal and 100 meter vertical. And observational error in the endogenic model technically G eliminated virtually completely. These are all, you know, I think I would consider it is mostly daydreams. But this is a, this is a impossible. Metrology is not a linear uh, science where you can do this. Uh, anyway, so this is a kind of vision that I'm not saying that I agree on this. This is mostly very philosophical and very much ambitious. I don't think we can agree. So I think I would uh, end here and say, concluding the mass, 
that climate change is impacting extreme events in a big way, the impact on India is going to be enormous. This is one thing that we need. We need a long-term plan to make uh, itself ready to face the consequences. They need to build human and institutional capacities in climate research in the country, and therefore the climate research agenda is needed. Uh, the intensity, uh, there is going to be increase in the frequency, intensity, and duration of extreme events, and this is going to pose a lot of challenges on weather forecasting. And therefore, we need to upscale weather forecasting and multi hazard warning system. Monsoon is going to be highly variable and predict unpredictable. And therefore, the, this is going to be a challenge for the scene. Now, the, so therefore, there is a need for all the research funding agencies to work together to support the strategic area of weather and climate research in a mission mode. So this is the purpose of this consortium, where we will uh, try to set up some uh, research fund so that we are able to support the uh, high-end research in the climate area in the country, not just for the intramural purpose, but also extramural. These are huge uh, expectations on the community, and uh, especially the young people are looking towards the funding agency. Uh, we are not going to uh, unfold the uh, strategy that we are working on, but uh, I can promise that we are going to work on a strategy where we will try to serve the larger caucus and going with a larger vision of uh, upscaling the climate research in the country to help addressing the issues that are going to come up as uh, part of uh, the climate projection in the country. I think I would end here. I must acknowledge the support from Suvimal Ghosh. He has, in fact, given most of the slides that I presented and at the end was provided by Suvimal. So none of them are my own, so I am only integrator and presenter. And, and also the entire climate research agenda drafting team, some of them are here. Uh, so they have all the... Uh, we, in fact, as I said, by the end of December, we are going to finalize the agenda. First part of the agenda is going to be finalized. It will be circulated for, uh, to the community for wider consultation and suggestion. And by March, we are going to present this agenda to a national conclave and finalize, and then all funding agencies will sit together and finalize. We want to follow a US system uh, where when a national agenda is created, then create the element of funding and identify people who will lead the different element of the funding. Uh, this is the idea that is this we are coming forward. Thank you so much for your question. Yes, yes, please. I would like to know the support of the DST for state funded universities and also the continued support of research. Number one. Number two is uh, DST's efforts in introducing the climate sciences at the undergraduate. I would like to know. So, you know, let me tell you. Uh, SERV has recently launched a state-centric funding system. Only state university. A state university research uh, support is given by SERV for the first time in the country. And no, because state university, we know, cannot compete with IATs and ISER and everything. And I know, we know very well. So this is a specific, so you know how many, uh, uh, applications have been received, 6,000. 6,000 uh, proposals have been received. We are, in fact, targeting to fund only 300. But now, in fact, uh, in the uh, CRV, we decided to increase it to 500. So 500 people will be funded this year uh, for, uh, from only state universities. And the other question is about 
Yeah, that is not our job. See, the DST should know where is the limit. So that is the job of Ministry of Education. You talk to them. Maybe we can take one more question. Yeah. Very nice lecture, but one thing, no. You said that uh, our in India, as far as India is concerned, climate change is increased more drought. It's not more drought. And also, you told in another slide that it will also actually increase the number of floods. Does it not contradict you? No, it's not contradictory. First of all, you know, the, uh, the, uh, our uh, uh, confidence on increasing drought is not much. So the, in, uh, in our Krishnan will tell you more detail. But it is already happening. You see, one part of the country, one part of the country has drought, the other part has the flood, put together normal monsoon. This is what is, the hap this is happening. So variability, both in time and space, is taking place. More frequent uh, heavy rainfall, short-lived. Short-lived heavy rainfall at the level of, say, city. So city rainfall is increasing. And you know, there is a study done recently, uh, in, uh, maybe many people knowing, I think it was done by Cristobal, uh, uh, that, you know, there is a close relation between the population density and that uh, and and the rainfall intensity, so I think we are we are now going towards a side where the rainfall and drought I and mean heavy rainfall and drought both are going to happen. A very short question, sir. You can. Uh, I thought your plan of future is very well thought of. I remember an article almost written about 50 years back on Professor Adrian Gill. He said a three-pronged approach for future research, what he called K-U-M. K is knowledge, U is understanding, M is model. That's exactly what the middle picture you showed. First observation, then understanding. You stretch on understanding, which I heard many talks earlier, that is totally missing. But unlike this talk, you stress on understanding, that I think is fundamental, and finally modeling. And now, there is one thing I thought, uh, probably you can think a little bit, too. unlike middle and high latitudes, where the dynamics is mainly controlled by the paraphilic system, which are from one to seven wave number. That is, what happens in West will happen in East at some time. And uh, in the case of tropics, uh, it is very, very different. What happens in Africa is different from what happens in Sir, happens can you in please India. make it short? Even in we, India, are, we are so having shortage of time. <laughs> please make it short, sir. Okay, okay. So what happens in India in one season is different from other seasons. So you have to give some stress about the parameterization of convection. I think that is very important. Well, I think I already mentioned, I think it was there in modeling. Parameterization is very key and that's what the process is. So I do not agree that India is completely gyrotropic. We have gyroclinicity. During monsoon, we have so much of gyroclinic system also. Yeah. Just one very short question from the young faculties or scientists or researcher. From the back, we, have, we are running shortage of time. Yes, please. Go ahead. Very crisp and short question. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, we are most focused on the modeling in completion to the uh, observational sections. So whether uh, when we are planning, we are focused to give the budget equally to modeling section as well as the observational section so that the relationship could be found and then feed to the model. So you know, you are right. You know, so I, I'll tell you very frankly, when uh, Dr. Ravi Chandran and myself, we said, you know, it, it, all this was planned on the breakfast table, by the way. So let's separate out the observation part, because that is entirely in the domain of Ministry of Earth Sciences. This plan is for research. And we knew that there are issues of uh, you know, observation, very serious issues are there. So I did include some issue like fire moisture, which is very critical now. But I think 
I don't deny it is a big issue on observation. And you need to take that also and think. And therefore, if a successful research program need to be executed, that cannot happen without a very uh, comprehensive observational program. I agree with you. S OK, that's quick, very quick. Yeah. Just uh, as part of COP27 recommendation, we have said that we have to, we need a loss and damage modeling also. So how DST is going to plan? So this because is, this is yeah. not a part of meteorology traditional. So you know the outcome of loss and damage uh, in the in the uh, recent COP. So basically, India wanted to put the loss and damage as a center stage. See, we lose 2% of the GDP every year due to extreme events, 2%. And where is the compensation for us? Ad apart from the adaptation, adaptation is one part. 2% of GDP, who is going to pay? So this is a, so uh, India is in fact the kind of warning system and paraphernalia that we have set up as part of the Ministry of Science and all is, is serving well to the country. But uh, we need to uh, have a uh, proper, uh, uh, these kind of things addressed to a national policy. So we, I, I agree that a, we still are not very clear on loss and damage. Sir, thank, thank you very much for giving and big justice views. And we have all seen in him that he has shown much concern to the climate research program with DST, with MOES, he has shown what are the vision 2030. There is a tremendous scope and opportunity for the young scientists, researchers, and faculties to address the issues. And what Professor just now mentioned about KUM, knowledge, understanding, and modeling, these are all different aspects if we concentrate in different areas that will definitely understand several issues. And then we'll be able to make some sort of modeling. Sir, once again, thank you. It is, thank a, you so much. Thank it is you. always uh, very nice to hear from you. And uh, climate research is always into the forefront because we are seeing its impact, we are seeing its evidences, and it is making a lot of implications to the society, health security, water security, mm -hmm. energy security, as well as many aspects of our life. So there is a tremendous scope and opportunity to take up the climate research, involve in different areas, and contribute for the growth of the science so that we'll make a socio-economic cultural growth of our country. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Much. Uh, just wanted to say at the end, see, I have always been concerned about the young people, and especially the students. So I wanted to give a good news that, you know, you know, SERV has, uh, you know, a scheme called NPDO, National Post Doctor Fellowship. And annually, we give 300 Post Doctor Fellowship. OK, so after uh, I took over as secretary, we thought that you, you must increase this number. So from this year onward, we'll have 1,000 to you. So I, I know that as this is so important topic, there will be endless questions. I mean, all of you can interact with uh, Dr. Gupta during the lunch time. Thank you very much. So we conclude the session here. Participants who still haven't shared their uh, presentation said they can share it in the email ID uh, or uh, you can share it in the PPT booth outside as well. Tell the sessions and all. No? Yes, yes, we are saying. So, so we are going. Uh, so, just for your attention, please. So, we we will be now splitting into the different sessions, and the uh, dynamics and climate change will be in this auditorium. So the. Though the speakers and the uh, people who are interested, participants interested in this topic, dynamics and climate change, are staying here. Ocean variability and extremes, they are going to the hall number one upstairs, seminar hall one, and cryosphere and glaciology are going into seminar hall two, that also is on the upstairs. So kindly make it convenient, we will start the session in next 10 minutes.
in respective halls. Thank you.
in the besides uh, pl plenaries. This is the first technical session that way. And in this we have the, the session is on dynamics and climate change. And the keynote address is, will be given by Professor Ravi Shankar Nanjundaya, my old friend for last many years. He has been uh, at the frontier of the modeling. And uh, you know, some, for some of the youngsters in the back, he has been the director of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, a very, very premier research organization in the climate change research. And he was director there. And uh, before that, he was the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, for many years. And after IITM director, again, he's at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. So he has been doing. So we have been interesting a lot that he does a lot of numerical modeling. And one interesting thing I have found whenever interacting, he's a very quiet person. You will always see very quiet and calm person. But the knowledge is very, very deep. So we expect a very good lecture by Dr. Nanjundiya. Sir, 20 minutes, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tell me because, you know, like yeah, I talk a lot. So My <laughs> job is only there to tell the time. Yeah. Well, we could not see him there, actually, that's why. I would rather prefer to keep this so that I can walk around. And mic is fine for me. It's, I think it's working. But fine. So you'll remove this. So okay. Okay. I'll start. So good afternoon. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank. Dr. Joshi for his very flattering introduction. Uh, well, huh? it's not working? No. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about AI and ML. And uh, as was repeatedly stressed by Dr. Akhilesh and others, this is one area where we need to really work on. And this is where I think the youngsters, the younger generation, has to kind of take the baton from us and uh, go further. We can only do that, that much with uh, AIM, and we can hardly understand it, to tell you the truth. You're the the, younger, the youngsters have to take it further. OK? So I'll tell you something about uh, what we can do with AIML and what we have tried to do with AIML. sciences, especially in climate and uh, oceanic sciences. The, big, the current thing that's happening is that you have a huge amount of data coming, and you have a huge number of observations and data 
coming from all sources. It could be from satellites, it could be from subsurface on conventional stations. Uh, so all this data is going to come. And uh, you also have bigger computers. So the idea is that we uh, kind of look at it and see what we can do more than what's already been done with all this data and how we can kind of improve the other leg of studies, that is modeling, for both prediction as well as, uh, the, let's say, understanding of the subject. So these are the areas where we can use AI and ML in weather and climate. Of course, one of them is weather and climate at various scales. And uh, the second one is on, these are areas I'm just kind of uh, mentioning. It's uh, downscaling, that is you have data at fine scales and, I mean at coarser scales and then for various things you could use the, this AIML technique very effectively to, uh, to a smaller scale so that you can kind of get those smaller scale picture, which could be like, you know, data from climate change. Uh, a climate change models typically run at about 100 kilometers today. It could be running at 50 in the future. But then it certainly won't go in, be going into one kilometer in the near future, as far as I can see. But we knew, do need data at much finer scales. For example, if you need to take a decision in, uh, let's say, for a state or even a subdivision uh, of a state, then you need to have data for that. And for that, you, your climate models by themselves will not give you this data. That's where downscaling it comes into picture. Basically, you kind of take data at uh, uh, coarser scale and try to make it into a finer scale. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, then one area which is data assimilation, that is you have input data coming from various sources and you would like to create a good initial condition, also an analysis to kind of do various studies. And that is uh, a new technique which is now kind of just being born, I would say, is called deep learning where you take conventional data uh, such as uh, and also techniques like Kalman filtering and combine it with deep, learn, uh, deep learning that is uh, a, uh, all of both of them together and we call it as data learning. Okay. Another area where we can use it is the bias correction of weather forecasts. Unfortunately, if there are biases in most models and uh, we would like to improve our forecasts. Whatever forecast comes from the model, we can still improve because we have a large amount of data now coming from both uh, conventional modeling and previous forecasts and observations. So we would like to combine the two so that we can reduce the bias in our weather forecasts. Prediction of extremes. Dr. Akhilesh mentioned that this is going to be more and more important, especially when you're in a changing climate scenario. And uh, you'll likely to have more heat waves, more cold waves, higher rainfall events. All of that are likely to happen in the future. Or actually, I would say that climate change is already upon us, and we are seeing more extreme events. And we need to predict on a fairly finer scale. If you'd like to, uh, your prediction, let's say, for one part of Bhopal, and see how rainfall is happening, it could be very different, let's say, about 20 kilometers away, which any conventional model may not be able to capture. That's where I think we can use AI and ML to kind of predict extremes, maybe with different lags or leads. The other area where we can look at is called as hybridization. That is, you, we already have numerical models. We can combine it with machine learning models. One of the areas could be where you have these clouds, which occur, let's say, at kilometer or sub-kilometer scales. Your models are running at about 10 kilometers. But the impact of cloud is very important, and you cannot resolve it. So to kind of take that, we usually use parameterizations. Now, Parameterizations usually happen because you take one observational data set from somewhere. For example, most of the current cumulus parameterizations are based on some data coming from Atlantic. And uh, that's about 20 to 30 years back. And on that, cumulus parameterizations have been set up. Newer ones, of course, are happening. But now we have data from satellites, a large number of large data which have come from satellites. And we would like to combine this information and create a new parameterization which could be applicable to different parts of the globe. 
And that would be where area, one area where you can kind of use machine learning with this large data and come by a kind of marry it off with uh, numerical models. And if you're going to very fine scales, like that of a solar or a wind farm, you can certainly use AI ML. In some sense, it would be, uh, could say that it's downscaling, but it, it will be much more than that when you're going to fine scale, such as that a solar farm. That's called as feature engineering. And you can also use it through a data set. That is, you have different data sets on one side of the machine learning. That is, you have these, more, most of you would have already uh, heard about NCEP NCAR reanalysis and the ERA reanalysis. You, that becomes a huge data set for you, and you can push it into a machine learning algorithm where you can use it. And uh, on the other hand, which is what we would be interested in is, is the problems that we can solve. So what are these problems? You have this problem of air pollution, which Dr. Akhilesh also mentioned. Then cyclones, heat waves, lightning forecasts, climate prediction, decadal prediction, seasonal scale forecasts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK, and these are the tools, which I think the younger side is already familiar with things like PyTorch, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so that's one more link to connect to machine learning. And then you have uh, education, where you can bring in deep info reinforcement, learning techniques, et cetera. So I'm not going to the details of it, but this is like a mind map which has been used to not just for, actually we built it up not just for atmospheric science, but also for entire earth sciences we had done it. It's a very nice review. I recommend that you can read it. It's freely downloadable. It's in current science, so freely downloadable. Okay. So actually I also would like to tell you that uh, there's a virtual AI ML center which has been set up at IITM, especially related to earth and uh, climate sciences, or earth sciences in general with particular reference for climate and weather studies. So now let's move into the first area, that is downscaling. So if you look at downscaling, it's a procedure of using uh, data from climate models at coarser resolution to provide uh, predictions at finer temporal and spatial scales. That is, if you have a monthly data or a daily data, you'd like to take a three-hourly data and the model might be giving you at 50 kilometers or so, you would like to have it at one kilometer or sub-kilometer scales, you can use this downscaling technique. That's where I think the deep learning techniques would come into picture. And there are a variety of those techniques which are there, such as ANN, the Artificial Neural Network, Long Short Memory, LSTM, Multilinear Regression, Support Regression, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, Further, we can use this downscale data for hydrological models to estimate stream flows. So this is a picture where you kind of get a coarser data and then kind of try to get the finer picture using downscaling techniques. So this is one case study of a downscaling technique. We took data from IMD, more like a case study, is what I will say, where the data is currently available at, on daily scale at 25 kilometers, and we try to kind of downscale it to 12.5 and 6.25. So the picture on the left is what the model is, uh, the original data set which IMD has created. And this is at 12.5 kilometers, and this is at 6.25. And some of the smaller scale features, depending on additional information that you give, you can always catch it at the downscale. So what I would like to mention that we did not have data at 12.5 kilometers or 6.25, and hence, we check the model by converting to 100 kilometers of IMD, just to see that the technique works correctly or not. And these are the other details which I will not go into. So we all, some time back, I guess about you know, 15 years back, we tried to do some downscaling for climate studies. And this was way back in 2009, where we used one of what was then considered to be the technique, uh, support vector machine. And this was for a, small river basin in northern Karnataka called um, Malaprabha. And we used various input predictors, like uh, long, wave, uh, long wave fluxes, short wave fluxes, etc. And the uh, sensible heat and the uh, latent heat fluxes. And downscaled T-min and T-max, that is maximum temperature and minimum temperature, using SVM. So these are some of the 
we took the data from the IPCC at that time, I guess, AR4, and see what happened. At, because the data would come at a very coarser level. And you would like to see what would happen to the particular basin. And for various scenarios, you can see that the temperatures are increasing. Another area where we can use data simulation is where, is where you get raw data from different sources, including satellites, etc., and model simulation. So you would like to combine the two of them. And we need to do assimilation to produce reliable and evenly distributed uh, climatic variables at grid resolutions. Because you would like to have a uh, nice gridded data which you can analyze rather than have a kind of a station kind of a thing. Five more minutes. Okay, then I have to really <laughs> rush through. But uh, this would be one area where data learning overcomes limitations in applying data simulation ML to a real world <coughs> problem. Bias correction, we know, as we said, we have uh, problems in the input, the um, predictions that we get, we would like to make them better. So we use uh, ML-based techniques like neural network or deep belief net network to kind of create a bias correction for the model. Hybridization, which I mentioned, that is we have physics-based models, the current numerical models, and we can use machine learning models, that is data towards knowledge and mathematical model together in a synergistic relationship. One of them could be, as I mentioned, was the cumulus parameterization problem. Similarly, anywhere you are kind of putting data in an empirical form way in a, any numerical model, you can use this uh, hybridization between physics-based model and machine learning. That would be a nice way to kind of bring the two together. Uh, I guess uh, one area where we, or rather my postdoc worked on was solar forecasting using a technique called dilated convolutional neural network. I'll skip in the interest of time. And this was some of the details that we have done. And this is some data. She at that time was working in US. And uh, she did that solar forecasting for Boulder for two centers. That is, one at Boulder, Colorado, and the other one at Fort Peck. So what she found was that the RMSEs were lower when you use convolutional neural network as compared to simple persistence. So it certainly is a fairly promising tool, I would say. This was just more of a proof of concept, but uh, it certainly was useful. And this is how the predicted one. It didn't do greatly, but it's certainly better than what persistence would have given. And this is the comparison between persistence and our model. Uh, I'll quickly talk about prediction of monsoons at various scales. One of them we used is a, what's called as a stacked encoder approach to monsoon prediction. So this is basically an automated feature learning and identifying new monsoon predictors. Then features at different levels of the abstraction are learned. And the deeper the layer that you make, the more complex are the features. <coughs> so these are some of the predictors that we took, like sea, sea level pressure, temperatures at two meters, et cetera, and kind of reduce the resolution using stacked encoder and then fed it into a model. And uh, it seems to be doing pretty well. So the combined predictors gives you about 3.7%, uh, that is of uh, sea level pressure and wind at, uh, I guess, at uh, 850 hectopascal. And the sea level pressure by itself gives you a 4% uh, improvement. And this is comparison with existing models. And it certainly looks like this model deep learning based model is doing better than the other statistical techniques. Uh, we also did for early part of the monsoon and the late part of the monsoon. I'll skip all that, but it seems that it's doing pretty well as compared to conventional techniques that uh, forecast for the early part of the monsoon is at 6.1% as compared with the standard deviation about 12 And the error is in the later part, that is, let's say, in August and September, is much lower as compared to the earlier part. And this is some comparison. And for the whole hom homogeneous regions, we have, which IMD has already mentioned, the different uh, regions. We used, we built a stacked encoder-based model for this. And uh, these are the results. And what I would like to stress again is that it's doing a pretty useful job 
as compared to con conventional statistical models and comparable to what the numerical models, which need a lot more computing. I'm not saying uh, conventional numerical models are good. I've been working it all the life, but this seems to be a promising technique we can take. And these are some other details. I will, uh, this is about active and break spells. Quite a bit of work has also been done by others, including Dr. Sahai and Dr. Upadhyay, uh, Chattopadhyay on using uh, self-organizing maps. We used LSTM techniques and we got reasonably good results. Uh, well, at longer lags, there is a problem. It, the error kind of drag, uh, drops significantly as you go longer in time. Uh, this is one technique which is also an emerging technique which is called as a, uh, this is deep learning weather prediction with DLWPS, which he recently published one of my young colleagues, Dr. Manmi, he has published this book, uh, sorry, this paper, and uses the concept of a digital domain. So other details I'll just skip and say that we have the MDL, WPSCS, seems to be doing better. This is comparable, this is GFS with ERAFI analysis, and this is our technique. So we can say that it's doing as well as GFS. This is just a first cut of it, and I'm sure we can do much better. And certainly doing better than linear regression. This is the correlation coefficients. This is for M, uh, sorry, our technique. Maybe the last slide you can put. Sure. Summarizing. There's nothing much in the last slide. OK. okay. That, that, <laughs> and so we have done also for ENSO. Yes. So in, a, in summary, what I would like to say is that there is tremendous scope to use AI and ML perhaps as a hybrid model, perhaps as a standard alone model. So I think that's where the youngsters can take over. Thank, Thank you, you, Ravi. Thank you very much. So one or two questions. So can we go first to the back, back side, if any student? No? Yes. Ramakrishna. According to Ed Lorenz and later by... Thank you, sir. According to Ed Lorenz and later by Yoshio Kurihara, if you take two initial states, similar states, one will develop into a cyclone and one will not. Do you think uh, AI will be able to explain this? Uh, it's always difficult to explain with AI because, you know, <laughs> and, I mean, understanding is you may not be able to get much with AI, but you can certainly get better predictions. Quite often we don't understand why AI is doing well. But it, it certainly does better. And of course, there is an understandable AI now coming into picture. Perhaps we could be able to do it. And you might be able to get more insight using AI ML as compared to a convention. It depends partly on the training. And also, you know, there are specialized techniques, which is called as understandable AI, which also you can use. But we have not used it, so I cannot comment. But I'm sure we can do it. As time develops, it will become better and better. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first question for which my answer is, you're looking at a much more complicated system. Uh, I mean, just as a lighter comment, it is said that uh, Einstein was asked, and he said, uh, if he meets God, he'll ask him about turbulence and weather and how it is kind of determined. <laughs> so I think that answers your question. As far as why we are not able to do unseen events, these techniques are still developing and not being used in an operational scale. I'm sure if we do the same thing with some hindcast data, we should be able to do it. For example, we are able to do uh, quite a few of the previous droughts uh, without looking at those data. That is, you are not using that data, but still you are able to look at droughts and uh, break spells and 
active spills. Certainly, we are doing it without actually looking at the data which was being fed in before. Okay. So I think it is a very rapidly developing field. So it happens every day. Every day I see a new technique and I don't yes, understand it. Yes, it will. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Partha. Okay, uh, Partha. Uh, no, I understood. See, yeah. the, there are techniques so, which are. So my question is: no. so if, if the data is not driven by extremes, how do you improve the variability? That's a billion dollars. Well, there are techniques which are used to capture extreme events. There are yeah. uh, techniques in AI and ML which you can. I mean, there are separate techniques for that. If you use them, and again, I have to look at data. I mean, if I don't see the data of uh, Mars and try to use the same model, obviously it will collapse and fall under space. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. I am Vinay Sagal from Indian Agriculture Research Institute, uh -huh. and uh, our stakeholders are farmer. And uh, one of the great job which has been done in climate science is providing agro-advisory services. But still, it has not yet come to the level of farm scale or, or, a, or a scale less than one kilometer resolution. So do you see much much use of AI ML in downscaling to one kilometer or less than one kilometer using some other satellite-based parameters which are available at high resolution? Uh, yeah, both conventional and satellite-based data, you should be able to do it. You, of course, you'll have to develop the model. I mean, it could be very site, I mean, specific. Let's say for a district, it might be different, or even at a sub-district. But then these are fast and easy to run. So we should be able to do that. But I myself have not done it, so I cannot say. But okay. yeah, for at a stream flow level, we have done it. At okay. a very small Thank river. You. One uh, from it. the younger, yeah, please. <laughs> Okay, I'll give an analogy. When numerical uh, predictions started, uh, the conventional meteorologists were not willing to accept. Okay, but then slowly they saw the how good the method was, and now it has been taken. They have kind of accepted it, and it's become the norm now. So, I mean, I'm over a period of time, I'm sure they will accept it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, no more because all we are already quite late. You can please discuss later. <laughs> so we end this uh, invited talk. My only comment at the end will be artificial intelligence is anyway artificial. So there will be some limitation with the intelligence. So there is difference between intelligence and artificial. <laughs> there is well, bound to be somewhere some problem with the AI. Uh, well, Thank human you. intelligence can never, yes. I mean, I'll say it will always beat the artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Ravi. You can, you can speak to him later. Sorry. We move to the next one. We have two. Uh, Invited speakers. First is uh, Dr. Professor Sunit Duvedi from University of Allahabad, and um, he will be speaking on multi-decadal variability in the teleconnection between Eurasian snow cover and Indian summer monsoon rainfall. I, I thought he is a ocean modeler, but here I find he is talking on something. But that is going to be interesting. Please go ahead. 15 minutes. Okay, Thank you very much. Hello. 
Yeah, today, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Sunit Devedi from University of Allahabad. And today, I am going to talk about uh, relatively less studied uh, this teleconnection between the Indian summer monsoon rainfall and the Eurasian snow cover on a multi decadal time scale. Uh, I will discuss, uh, even though uh, the limit of predictability of the monsoon has reached to nearly 70 percent, but uh, using the like dominant or using the well known predictable drivers of the monsoon, for example, ENSO, for example, PDO, if we combine them, then we can predict the monsoon on a seasonal or from a, from interannual to like, like longer time scales up to a 50 percent at best of the times and 10 to 20 percent at worst of the times. So there should be some more predictable drivers which are into action and we are not emphasizing more on them uh, actually on a, on a longer time scale. So it is and uh, there was no research actually. The past researches have been done to see the teleconnection between the uh, this Eurasian uh, snow cover fraction and the Indian monsoon rainfall, but there was no research which was, which was available, which was actually an, which has analyzed or seen the uh, variability on a multi-decadal time scale. So here our uh, emphasis was more to see the multi-decadal time, time scale and uh, how this uh, Indian monsoon actually varies on a multi-decadal time, time scale with service variability of the snow cover fraction. And what are the major factors which are regulating this multi-decadal variability, if not ENSO, if not PDO, if not uh, like IOD, or uh, uh, this Atlantic uh, multi-decadal oscillation, then what is driving it? So for that purpose, we have done some causal teleconnections also, which is a new technique. Uh, we have seen the cause-effect uh, relationship of the ENSO with the <coughs> uh, of the NAO with the snow cover fraction and with the Indian monsoon uh, rainfall. And we have come up with a mechanism how this uh, snow cover fraction, it actually regulates the North Atlantic oscillation and then to the Indian summer monsoon rainfall through the modulation of tropospheric temperature gradient. And uh, this is what I'm going to actually show you in the following slides. Yeah, because it is very inconvenient to like take it hand and speak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is better now. Yeah, so ENSO monsoon teleconnection can explain 40 percent of the variability. So uh, this is especially important for those teleconnections which are known from decades, actually centuries, but they have not been actually looked into the detail, detail more detail, and and therefore we have actually uh, seen, especially as land surface forcings or the. Uh, the, uh, the the teleconnection of the Indian summer monsoon rainfall with the sea level pressure from the extra tropics or the sea surface temperature from the extra tropics and the uh, teleconnection of the Indian summer monsoon rainfall with the snow cover fraction from the Eurasian region. So researches have been done to see the uh, Himalayan Tibet, Tibetan plateau snow cover fraction, its teleconnection with the monsoon, the teleconnection of the snow cover fraction with the monsoon, but not over a longer duration of time. So. Uh, so it was desirable to estimate how much variance of ISMR internal variability could be attributed, if, along, if at all, to the Eurasian snow, snow, snow cover variability. So the question that we have asked, are these changes specific to this period? Uh, recently we have seen that there is a lot of like, epochal variation from a negative actually teleconnection between the Indian summer monsoon rainfall and snow cover fraction to a very high positive teleconnection. From 1967 to 2015, we have seen a dramatic drift between the teleconnection of the Indian summer monsoon rainfall and snow cover fraction. So whether these patterns are limited to this particular period or the, it was a, a like slowly varying process which has which has which have been which is, which is happening from the uh, last century. So this is the question that we have asked, and uh, whether there is a trend in the teleconnection between the Europe, Eurasian snow cover fraction and the monsoon rainfall. So these are the two major questions that we have asked, and these are the data used. I will be telling you more about these data sets as we go ahead in the months and in the slides. And this is the causal in inference method. This is the new method, and I have used the PCMCI method along with the 
along with the uh, Gaussian process regression and distance correlation. So this is the new method for uh, looking at the uh, causality analysis or causal teleconnections. Uh, suppose we find teleconnection between those uh, two phenomena. So, what is the cause and effect? Which process is driving the process? How they are interconnected? And whether this is like uh, this teleconnection is uh, regulated by various processes. So, for that purpose, we have seen we have uh, also uh, employed the causal inference method (PCMCI). PCMCI. And uh, I started by doing the like the uh, famous the EUF analysis, and we, we actually extracted the dominant mode of periodicity. And this is the ISMR PC1, ISMR PC2. These are two dominant modes. So this is this is well-known graph. So this ISMR PC1 I have taken as the ISMR index because it it relates very well with the IATM homogeneous rainfall index. And the uh, other one is the dipolar ISMR2 index. And this is the first result that I'm, I wanted to show you. This is a spatial teleconnection between the PC, like the ISMR1, and the uh, uh, March, April, May snow cover fraction. So here you see that these are the uh, three cartoons. In the first one, this is from 1901 to 2015. This one is from 1961 to 1990. And this is 1991 to 2015. So I have taken these two periods because a dramatic shift has been observed in the, in the kind of index to define the snow cover fraction. People have seen the effect of snow cover fraction from the eastern and uh, western side of the Eurasian snow cover fraction, and the result result, result results were very different. Similarly, the if you take the central Eurasian uh, region, then the results were actually different. So, so here, if you if you see this from this correlation analysis, we see that actually there is indeed a great shift in the teleconnection in the teleconnection between the snow cover fraction and Indian summer monsoon rainfall from being very highly negative in 1961 to 1990 over the central Eurasian period, it has become highly positive over the eastern Eurasian period. And similarly, there is a monopolar uh, kind of uh, actually structure existing. When we relate the PC2 with the, with the uh, snow cover fraction, this uh, pattern shifts from uh, central Eurasian region to eastern Eurasian region. So based on these two, uh, uh, based on this particular analysis, we have defined actually uh, two new uh, snow cover fraction indices, namely the SCF1 and SCF2. SCF1 is taken as a difference from uh, uh, difference of snow cover fraction over this particular region, black box minus the magenta box over this particular region, and that is how we, we created the snow cover fraction index one. And similarly, if we take the difference between these two, then the snow cover fraction. Uh, uh, two is, uh, index 2 is defined and the periodicity of these two actually indices, it matches very well with the periodicity of Indian summer monsoon rainfall, the PC1 and PC2, <coughs> as well as the snow cover fraction. Uh, so these two indices actually they have, they are, they have the same periodicity. So then what, what we have done, we have actually uh, carried out a, a moving correlation analysis between the snow cover fraction and the uh, ISMR index and this is how the curve looks like. You see that uh, except over this particular region with the central period of 1958 in the 15-year 15, 15 uh, moving correlation, and this analysis has been carried out from 1901 to 2015, taking the data from 20th century analysis. Uh, so only during this particular period you find a negative correlation. Otherwise, the correlation is <coughs> positive, and it, it is becoming dominantly positive actually in the recent decades under the influence of global warming. So it proves that. Uh, ISMR, that actually the snow cover fraction is becoming a very uh, reliable, oh, uh, it is becoming a, a good predictor of the new human monsoon rainfall in the context of climate change. So the snow cover fraction and uh, ISMR PC2 uh, moving correlation analysis, and here you see a little bit of decrease in the correlation, which is actually observed in the observations also. So these, uh, from uh, the, the SEO, and uh, we have also actually carried out the same analysis using the observed data from 1967. So, uh, so the, uh, the data from reanalysis it, it matches well with the observations. So, the, so we can actually say that the uh, snow cover fraction from the reanalysis is reasonable and the close correspondence between the observed and reanalysis data is seen. And the, these are the periods 
it is like uh, nearly 30 to 45 years in the correlation, moving correlation between uh, slow cover fraction 1 and uh, ISMR PC1, and this is nearly 60 to 70 years, uh, or 50 to 60 years for the slow cover fraction 2 and PC2. And we also see that there is a trend also actually there, because there is a positive trend is also there in the long term correlation. So not only the trend is there, but multi digital variability in the correlation is also seen. So what we actually we have computed the, the standard deviation of this multi digital variability and the trend. So in this particular case, they were of the same order. The multi digital variability and the trend are of the same order, whereas in this particular <coughs> case, multi digital variability is much stronger as compared to the trend. So in order to actually see whether these particular uh, actually indices are, uh, are, are how these indices are related with the total IATM mean monsoon rainfall, the inter internal monsoon rainfall. So we found that the correlation between ISMR PC1 and IATM rainfall, uh, the IATM uh, rainfall data is nearly 0.86. So we have taken the uh, point nearly 0.86. So, th so this particular index is taken ISMR PC1 and IATM JJS rainfall. Uh, so we have also carried out the same analysis using the IATM data and the results match very well with each well, 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 they match very well with each other. We find that uh, uh, the ISOMAR PC1 and SCF1 index moving correlation matches very well with the IATM JJS rainfall and SCF1 index correlation. So that is uh, why that, that, uh, then we can say that the Eurasian snow cover fraction is a useful predictor of the ISMR over these time periods. And we have also checked the influence of, actually if you go to the previous slide, we have also checked the influence of ENSO, ENSO, IOD, PDO, and the AMO phenomenon by actually uh, linearly removing those signals from uh, this particular time series. And we found that the influence of these particular, like oceanic climatic mode, is not there actually on the relationship between the snow cover fraction, on the teleconnection between the snow cover fraction and the Indian monsoon rainfall on these time scales or over this over, over a particular century. So then we started to look at the factor, diagnose the factors which are responsible for uh, this particular connection. So first, uh, the first thing that we did was to look at the same correlation with the tropospheric temperature gradient, because which is responsible for onset and withdrawal of the monsoon, JGS monsoon. So we find that, so this is the curve of the, this, this blue curve denotes the correlations, the moving correlation between the snow cover fraction and tropospheric temperature gradient, whereas the black one is the, is the, is the, is the earlier curve. So we find that the similarity and the coherence in multi digital variability suggests the mechanism of SCF influencing the ISMR. So in order to, uh, so then we also actually further uh, to, to see the robustness in this relationship, we have regressed the SCF on the tropospheric temperature anomalies for three different periods, 2001 to 2015, depending on these actually this particular graph, uh, corresponding to positive and negative correlations. And we found that this uh, this particular, when the tropospheric temperature gradient is positive, we see very uh, very, very high rainfall in, in these two periods, whereas when the temperature gradient is negative, we see the lesser rainfall over this particular period. So this, uh, this particular graph shows the robustness of SCF index. And uh, to further diagnose why this is happening, this particular phenomenon, if, if none of the climatic modes coming from the ocean are responsible this, for this particular phenomena, then something from the atmosphere must be responsible for this. So we look at the relationship, the relationship of uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation Index, and we found that, and this is the actually SCF1 and ISMR, we are shown by black lines, whereas SCF1 for two different regions, for March, April, May, and for the February, March, April season, you see they are highly coherent with each other, and uh, they go one in one, and uh, some. And uh, uh, if you see the correlation of the ISMR and NAO also with the variability, you find that whenever they are both of them are decreasing together, then we see very high correlation between the SCF and the ISMR. So snow cover fraction it becomes really important or when the uh, steady connection between the uh, ISMR NAO and uh, snow cover NAO is increasing. So in order to but okay, so in order to further look at the uh, why this is happening, we have done the causal Teleconnection analysis also. This, so this particular graph is very important. Here you see which mechanism is driving the other mechanism. Here you find that uh, the TTG and uh, ISMR they are confounded. There is no simultaneous teleconnection between the TTG and ISMR. This is also true actually because after the monsoon sets in, ISMR actually influences the uh, TTG 
Conclusion now. Yes. The changes are there for uh, this change of relationship between the ISMR are investigated. This, this relationship is non stationary. Uh, there is a lot of local variation between the snow cover fraction and the inter summer monsoon rainfall. The correlation between the snow cover fraction and NAO uh, it is, it has a small scale structure. Uh, it shows that small scale structure of SCF is a potential driver of large scale circulation changes by the NAO. Moving correlation in causality analysis. It shows that NAO influences the ISMR variability and thereby modulates the long term ISMR ISMR degradation on the digital time scale. And uh, our result warrants for a review of classical concepts of any connection with the Indian monsoon to the surface temperature gradient. And if, they, if, if these uh, sensitively applied causal inference behavior, they can go a long way. And uh, using these the kinds of uh, schemes, we can actually come up with the uh, telecreation mechanisms in a, in a better way. And the results are published here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sunit. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, time was not actually my time. Okay, let me ask you the physics of the problem. Why there is connection between uh, small and uh, snow cover and monsoon? What is the physics? And if you could try to understand the physics, then you can try to understand the changes, why it is all. Sir, Can you yeah, explain yeah. to me what is the physics behind? He is considering a European snow cover. Sir, I am taking the Eurasian snow cover, not the Himalayan okay. 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 That's it. <laughs> so, it is, I, I am telling you it is. Yes, sir. The one I remember is uh, Himalayan snow. Yes, sir. Himalayan snow. Correct, sir. These, those things were there actually, sir. Uh, hello, Dr. Trivedi. One question only. When you are saying that you know the relation between Eurasian snow cover, ISMR is not at all stationary, it is varying negative and positive, then how can you say that it is a useful predictor for IMS or no warming? Sir, because in a, in correlation has to be stable over a long period of time. No, then only there will be some use. Sir, that statement is for recent decades. Mm. Decade, but it keeps on changing. Yes, sir, it keeps on changing, but mm. in, the, in the last 20, 30 years, it is highly positive. The correlation between them has, uh, are as large as 0.7. This is what okay. I am saying. So in recent decade, after 1980s, this correlation is becoming more and more important. So you did not answer to my question. Sir, I will answer your question. This is a long question. Yeah, yeah, that we can discuss. Sir, this is the surface equation, the Excuse me, I have a one question. So what is the pathway through which uh, SCF uh, influences TTG, the uh, tropospheric uh, gradient, that, uh, is the that, is, that is what I have actually explained in, the, in this particular slide. I, I want the right. pathway. What is the physical is process which really? So, uh, so this is the North Atlantic oscillation. Yeah. North Atlantic oscillation, it modulates the tropospheric temperature gradient. So what is the pathway? Physics? What is the pathway? <laughs> this is this is what I have. I, so snow cover fraction actually influences the North Atlantic Oscillation. If you know about North Atlantic, Atlantic Oscillation, okay. then it has it has, it is a large scale phenomena which is which, which actually varies on a climatic climate scale. So and that particular phenomena then influences the tropospheric temperature gradient. Okay, okay. If you know the actual physics, then it cannot be summarized actually in this particular talk. <laughs> yes. Actually, uh, you 
always there is lag one month two month three yes, month yes, that yes. means the monsoon is always related to the pre monsoon correct correct so yes. that there is no relation between monsoon and post monsoon so here uh, i am not talking about monsoon this is the jjs monsoon rainfall yeah. and these months are taken so snow cover fraction is taken 3 months earlier so for february march april or march spring snow cover influences the following or jjs monsoon that is what i am saying here so that i am asking so that monsoon if you see that post monsoon i have monsoon not seen the i have not seen the effect effect on the post monsoon season okay you have not Because seen some kind of hydrological feedback has to be involved Okay. Snow cover fraction cannot sustain the uh, entire JJS monsoon. Okay. Right. I think we agree. Small scale phenomena, which influences the large scale phenomena, which then sets in the. Ah, okay, okay. uh, that I have not seen. <laughs> okay, we are interested. But, uh, but uh, uh, if I, to be very frank, uh, the snow cover fraction it cannot modulate this uh, the post monsoon. Uh, October, yeah, or December, January, February, or September, October, February. Good enough, Professor Sunit. After, after later, 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 you can explain. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So this combined with hydrological feedback. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Very much. We move to the next one from the same university, Allahabad University, yes. same JK Energy Center, Ahmed Sahab Space Center. Yes, sir. And uh, Dr. Shailendra Rai. Yes. He is going to speak. Role of Southern Indian Ocean in modulating Indian summer monsoon. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work. They are not here. The topic of my okay. talk is role of Southern Indian Ocean in modulating Indian summer monsoon. And uh, the collaborator in this uh, work is Dr. Namend Kumar Sahi. He is my he was my PhD student, but he is presently working in CMCC, uh, Italy. Uh, it is a well-known fact that the tropical Indian Ocean uh, modulates the Indian summer monsoon, and there is one mode of variability that that, that is Indian Ocean Dipole. Uh, it was discovered in 1999, and uh, it has uh, it has been uh, studied extensively. Many studies has been done to see the influence of Indian Ocean Dipole on Indian summer monsoon, but. Uh, there is another uh, mode of variability in the southern indian ocean it is called uh, southern indian ocean uh, 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 indian ocean subtropical dipole it was discovered in 2001 it is le less is explored uh, there are some uh, studies which uh, which has been done to see the impact of southern indian ocean to influence the anomalies over tropical indian ocean and so in indian australia summer monsoon but influence of southern indian ocean on indian summer Hello. monsoon variability has been less explored Hello. so for Hello. this uh, work i have used uh, only sst data uh, uh, had sst data from 1952 Hello. to 2013 and uh, uh, for atmospheric Hello. variables Hello. i have used ansep and car the analysis Hello. from 1983 to 2013 at uh, 2.5 uh, degree by 2.5 degree resolution and for uh, to see the influence of these sst and uh, 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 over the land points of india i have used indian uh, uh, indian meteorological hello, department hello, uh, hello, hello. Uh, uh, graded rainfall data at 25 km by 25 km resolution during 1952 to 2013 i have uh, uh, i have divided my talk in two parts in first part i have just uh, uh, analyzed the sst of southern i have computed euf Uh, during I have divided the, the entire data set from 1952 to 
in two parts from 1952 to 1982 and then from 1983 to 2013 this is the uh, uh, uf uh, uh, result we are seeing the clear dipole like structure which is which is very close to uh, the dipole like structure which was proposed by uh, the work by uh, in 2010 a uh, subtropical indian ocean dipole uh, work so based on this uh, uf uh, pattern we have computed some indices subtropical uh, sdi indices for uh, uh, two different seasons djf and maf and for uh, mam march april may and for two time domain that is from 1952 to 1982 and 1983 to 2013 and uh, uh, these uh, these are the reasons we we have taken the area average uh, of uh, sst anomaly for these two regions and then taken differences to compute the indices so uh, when uh, we we uh, regressed the rainfall only in the month of june not all i have not taken all the months i have taken just june month i have also analyzed all the other months but in june months we have seen some differences in june months when we regressed the rainfall with respect to sdi G dgf from 1952 to 82 and sdi uh, mam we are not uh, getting any relationship between the, these uh, the june rainfall and sdi indices but when we uh, did in 1983 2013 we are getting some negative relationship in the month of june only so to 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 do it further to uh, we we computed the 30 year running correlation between uh, sdi dgf and rainfall in the month of june in the recent years we are getting negative correlation coefficients which was not there in earlier years then we uh, did the composites of uh, rainfall in the month of june for positive uh, sdi in the month of uh, dgf and negative sdi and uh, as as we have observed uh, in in the uh, the regressed model uh, uh, from 1983 to 2013 we are getting negative uh, uh, rainfall over entire india and for uh, negative sdi we are getting positive rainfall similarly for uh, mam uh, season also we are getting negative and positive so this this shows that there is a relationship between uh, june rainfall and sdi indices so to to uh, see that how physically it is possible we have uh, done the composites of uh, uh, winds in the month of june for negative sdi and positive sdi for both uh, for dgf season and uh, in the negative sdi we are getting some correlation uh, some circulation pattern there in southern indian ocean and through mascarene high it is going towards the land points of india so this may be one of the reasons that the rainfall is decreasing during uh, rainfall is increasing in negative sdi and uh, opposite is the case for uh, positive sdi the winds are going away from the land points of india so this may be one of the reasons there may be uh, other reasons but, th but this is one of the reasons this may be one of the reasons so in uh, first part we can uh, conclude that uh, that uh, sdi of dgf and mam these are like uh, six months duration uh, uh, during 1983 to 2013 impact rainfall over india in the month of june only uh, it is uh, uh, physically uh, to see the physical pattern we have uh, also uh, done the wind patterns which favors the enhancement of rainfall during negative sdi and opposite is the true for positive sdi in second part we have uh, 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 the time domain is same but the reason of analysis i have uh, uh, taken some uh, entire uh, like uh, from 60 degrees south to 60 degree north i have taken sst data and uh, uh, the uh, in this i have taken jjs rainfall and did a correlation uh, coefficient analysis from jjs rainfall and monthly sst anomalies for different months 
and based on this correlation we have we have come we have taken some indices p1 p2 p3 p4 p5 p6 like this for these months and these are the regions uh, given in uh, uh, in the, this table for these months and these are indices, different indices, these are the special domain and the correlation coefficient with ISMR we are getting some, uh, for some indices it, it is negative, for some indices it is positive. So based on this uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, devised, uh, we have uh, made some simple multi-degradation models, five models. Uh, based on different combinations of predictors. So uh, the, the correlation coefficients, the, the uh, correlation coefficients from 1982 to 2001 training period and test period 2002 to 2013, we are getting high correlations for, uh, especially for model four and five, the, the predictions are good. This, we can see it from uh, different models and MLR models for, uh, to predict ISMR rainfall, average rainfall over, all over India. Then uh, we, to see it further, how it is happening, we have uh, done the regression maps of JGS precipitation anomalies onto uh, these indices. So, so far, uh, the indices in which we are getting negative relationships, we are getting negative rainfall uh, regressed maps over India. And uh, for the indices in which we are getting positive, we are getting positive rainfall over land points of India. So, this also clearly indicates that uh, it is uh, related. To do it further, we have uh, uh, computed regression maps of JJS winds anomalies onto these indices and uh, in this these uh, regressed map also we can see that for those indices in which we are getting negative relationship the winds are coming out of the land points of India and for th uh, these, uh, those indices in which we are getting uh, positive the winds are going towards land points of India. Then we uh, uh, did the JGS seasonal anomaly composites of rainfall for positive years and for negative years. Similar is the case for positive years. Since P1, uh, we, are, we, were, we were seeing the negative relationship. It is negative over land points of India for positive years and for negative years, it is positive. Similar is the case for other indices. Then uh, I have seen the JGS seasonal anomaly composites of wind for positive years. And for negative years, for positive years, since P P1 was negative, the winds are going out of the land points of India. And uh, for negative years, it is uh, coming towards land points of India. So in this uh, part, we can conclude that uh, we identified eight SST predictors based on the spatial pattern of correlation coefficient between ISMR and SST during 1982 to 2013 and we constructed different uh, multilinear degradation models uh, and we are seeing that the forecast scale is high to predict how I observed ISMR from these models and uh, we have also seen the robustness and physical mechanism of the observed teleconnections between SST predictor and ISMR by uh, regressing the rainfall and wind corresponding to all the eight SST predictors. predictors. Although uh, this is a uh, like a statistical type of work, so it requires uh, state-of-the-art modeling experiments to 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 verify these teleconnections. We can uh, we can do it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. So the first part is very interesting and that is very useful. You remember there is a book by Professor Krishnamurti, Tropical Meteorology. Yes. I think he was the man who first started the importance of muscarine high. Yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Very yes. interesting. Yes. But you should go further into it. What I'm yes. saying okay. is don't leave there. Okay. Go further to, put, to understand what the physical mechanism is. Yes. Go deeper into that.
Okay, we are doing it, seriously. We are doing it. Thank you, Professor Rai. Thank you. So with this, uh, we conclude uh, one in, uh, keynote address, two invited talks. Thanks to the speaker. And organizers want to give some token memento to the invited speakers and the keynote speaker. Well, I would like to invite the keynote and the invited speakers onto the stage. And they would be felicitated by our chair. So first, I would like to invite Dr. Ravi Shankar. Now I would like to, like to invite Professor Sunit Duvedi. <laughs> Dr. Shailendra. So this part is over. Now we have two more oral presentations. And uh, can go. two more oral presentations, 10 minutes each. The first one is Dr. Subhi Agrawal. Is there? Yes. Please, go ahead with your presentation. 10 minutes? If you want comments, you can finish in eight minutes. Hello, everyone. I hope I am audible and visible. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my topic for presentation today is precipitation biases in the East Asian monsoon and uh, mo monsoon region and their association with circulation bias in the CMIP-6 models. Uh, so the aim, uh, and I would like to thank my collaborators here. Uh, so I am Shubhi Agrawal, and my uh, collaborators are Ruth, Dipanjan, Hugo, and Jeff. All of them have contributed different parts yeah, of this presentation. Which, which institute, you can say that? I am from uh, Aisa Bhopal. I am assistant professor at okay. Aisa Bhopal. Uh, so the idea here was to uh, understand Asian uh, uh, monsoon system uh, at large and to understand uh, how these different biases or the different precipitation systems within the Asian monsoon system are related to each other or affect each other. And the main focus was on East Asian monsoon because the project was funded by China. Uh, uh, this is the JJ's climatology from GPCP precipitation uh, and the winds are from JRA 55 uh, reanalysis data sets. And what you see here is the large scale precipitation system, and this is our Asian monsoon domain. So the uh, focus uh, was East Asia. And in this study, uh, what I have been focusing is how East Asian precipitation bias is related probably to Northwest Pacific precipitation domain. And also, I wanted to understand how Indian monsoon is uh, probably related with East Asian uh, monsoon system. And I'll show some results here. Uh, related to these. Uh, if we look at low level circulation for, for this domain, uh, focusing on Eastern Asia, then two main source of moisture transport for this region is uh, one, the Somali jet, which brings uh, moisture from southwesterly direction. And apart from that, we have uh, West North Pacific subtropical high here, this circulation, which is responsible for a lot of moisture transport to the East Asian uh, region. And this I'll be calling as WNPSH in subsequent slides. And the winds associated with this circulation, which are mostly southeasterly, they are responsible for a lot of southerly moisture transport to the East Asian region. 
uh, these are two regions. I have demarcated uh, this region into north and south because the precipitation variability here is, uh, it has a dipole sort of structure. Uh, and during JJS, they are uh, out of phase or anti-correlated uh, with some strength. So uh, northern uh, East Asia is 30 to 40, uh, this box, and southern part is 20 to uh, 30 north. And uh, both these are within 110 to 120 east. Uh, so uh, we wanted to back up our results. Like before moving to model, uh, completely model analysis, we wanted to see some signatures from observation, which are more realistic and believable. So uh, this uh, part is contributed by the collaborator, uh, Dipanjan Day. And uh, what he has done is he has used uh, uh, ERA interim data for 20 years, and he has identified moisture sources for East Asia from different ocean basin domains. So uh, Pacific Ocean domain, South, Southern Indian Ocean domain. Uh, so this will be mostly related to Somali jet. And Pacific is mostly related to uh, the Southeasterly associated with the subtropical high circulation. Uh, then uh, East Asia region in itself has large contribution from local recycling. So the local recycling component uh, from South Asia and East Asia, and in blue you see the totals. So the most dominant part of precipitation, this is precipitation in Sodrup. Uh, so most uh, dominant part you'll see is in green, which is the local recycling part. Uh, but the uh, important characteristic that we observed here was the local uh, contribution from EA, it is high, but it is not related to interannual variability of uh, precipitation within, uh, it's not as strongly related uh, to precipitation variability in this domain as the oceanic sources, which can be seen in uh, pink and black. And they do have some variability uh, within J April to September, which is quite large. And if you look at just the recycling component, it does have some variability, but it's uh, rather small. So the same thing is quantified and showed at interannual uh, time scale. So this is from 1999 to 2018. And in red, you see the total <coughs> variability uh, uh, associated with precipitation. And uh, the non-local contribution, which uh, here we are uh, trying to focus only on two uh, non-local forces, which is from Pacific and the Indian Ocean, Southern Indian Ocean. This is quite large compared to the local contribution. And if we look closely, then uh, the purple color uh, from the Pacific, it shows larger contribution to East Asia precipitation variability compared to other ocean uh, domains. So moving on from here to uh, another observation-based uh, result. And this, uh, what I am trying to show here is the correlation between, uh, or the association between different uh, monsoon regions. And this is uh, the Northeast Asia precipitation, like this box precipitation, mean precipitation JJS, is regressed with precipitation all over the globe. And in red, you see the regions which are positively uh, related to <coughs> Northern East Asia precipitation, which means they vary along with it, and they have similar sort of interannual variability. And these two regions, Southern East Asia and Northwest Pacific region, they are out of phase with Northern East Asia region. Now these regions are important because they are uh, closely related geographically and precipitation uh, distribution here is not independent of each other. So precipitation variability is related in these regions. So if we try to understand the variability uh, together for these regions, we might be able to point out to one source of error or one source uh, of uh, uh, like one dominant source of variability which affects precipitation distribution in these regions. And this has been uh, like shown in some next slides. So now, uh, these are the CMIP-6 uh, results. So these are from uh, CMIP-6 models, historical simulations, uh, which are the past runs. And the data here is uh, from 1979 to 2015 onwards. And we have considered around 24 models, which had reasonably uh, reg uh, like uh, regular data. and grid size and uh, resolution was also a consideration here. So we have tried to include all the models with similar uh, grid resolution and so on. And what you see here is the JJS precipitation bias between models and observation uh, from CMAP. So in blue, you see positive anomalies. And in red, you see the negative anomalies. And uh, 
Asian monsoon domain, it has large precipitation biases. And in many of these models, you'll notice uh, these three regions, North, West Pacific, and East Asia, North and South, they, they seem to have some uh, dipole structure or out of phase relationship. And it comes across uh, even visually in these models. So uh, now uh, looking at JJS evaporation, uh, so we wanted to understand uh, for precipitation, we wanted to identify the main source of uh, uh, main source of moisture. So in the evaporation biases, uh, which is just evaporation from CMIP and JRE55, so uh, what we noted was uh, the magnitude of evaporation biases across all these models is rather small. And most of the precipitation bias can be actually attributed to P minus E, which is sort of proxy for moisture convergence term. So uh, it gave us some idea that the biases across these models is probably largely influenced by circulation biases and not so much by local recycling component. Uh, in this figure, uh, what you see here is uh, Z850 meter height contour uh, in blue. So this is uh, 1500 light blue and dark blue is 1510. And here you can get an idea about the subtropical high strength. So uh, between all these models, you'll notice that the western edge of uh, North West Pacific subtropical high, it is uh, located differently across these models. So there are biases across models in uh, simulating the subtropical high strength and its westward extent, which can largely influence uh, wind circulation and moisture transport in East Asia region. So from here, we define the western edge of the uh, uh, western of western edge of the subtropical high circulation and we found the longitude uh, for uh, each of these models and that uh, longitude and uh, precipitation they are plotted in these figures and all the models are summarized here so this is for northern east asia uh, this is for southern east asia and this is for northwest pacific and on the x axis you see as the western edge of uh, Western North Pacific subtropical high in degree east. And uh, what is amazing here is that we can clearly see there is a correlation, a negative correlation between northeastern subtropical high. So the more uh, it is westward, uh, so more shifted uh, towards westward, which is uh, in, like more towards the East Asian. Uh, sorry. The more sh it is shifted to the uh, westward or it closer to the East Asia continent, higher is the precipitation in the northern part of East Asia and lower precipitation is seen in uh, southern part of East Asia and North West Pacific Ocean. So this is what is summarized here. Uh, the negative correlation is because uh, the westward shift is a negative quantity. So you'll see negative correlation. And all these models, uh, they show nice a correlation and especially uh, this relationship is strong or the influence of western subtropical high is strong for northern and west pacific region and not so much over southern east asia probably uh, we also compared southern east asia uh, like between uh, amip and coupled model and we found that for southern east asia uh, the uh, variability could be coming from uh, oceanic uh, processes and so on so uh, in short uh, what happens is basically uh, with a shift, westward shift in western north Pacific subtropical high, the southerly component of the winds uh, increases for northern and uh, southern East Asia both. And it causes a lot of moisture uh, convergence mostly in the northern East Asia part and uh, slightly lesser in southern East Asia part. Uh, we also investigated the relationship between Finletter jet, uh, so the moisture transport. This last slide. Uh, so this, is, this was to uh, understand the relationship between Indian monsoon and East Asia. And across the models, we didn't find any strong correlation between strength of jet and East Asian monsoon precipitation. And this could be due to multiple reasons. Uh, this is uh, not pointing at lack of physical relationship, but it could be also just uh, the, there are large biases in simulating Finletter jet across these models and large uh, wind, uh, low level wind biases. So with this, I think I'll wrap up and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shubhi. Yes? You, you don't need anyway, Mike. You don't need. I don't need yes. <laughs> uh, how did you know Ruth Jean, you went to Caltech? 
Uh, so I was doing my postdoc uh, at University of Exeter. Huh? I, I was doing my postdoc at University of Exeter before joining ICE Bhopal. So I was there last year. Yeah, but she did a lot of very important Yeah, 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 yeah. She, there is a review. Review side of You read the and, paper? Yes, yes, and yes. Yeah, I am heavily impressed by her work. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subhi. Thank you. So the last one is Mr. Sumit Mukherjee. Yeah, please come. Unprecedented rainfall intensification over Western India during 2019 summer monsoon. Hello everyone, I am Sumit Kumar Mukherjee. I am from IITM. Sorry. Mike. Yes. Okay. okay. Hello everyone, I am Sumit Kumar Mukherjee. I am from Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. Today I am going to present my research work, recent research work, the unprecedented rainfall intensification over Western India during the 2019 summer monsoon. Over the past few decades, uh, the Central Indian region and um, the uh, whole of, mostly the whole of the West Indian region is uh, uh, experiencing the decreasing trend in mean monsoonal rainfall, whereas the extreme rainfall events are in, on the rise. But in case of Western India, mostly in the Maharashtra, coastal Maharashtra, and uh, Gujarat region, it shows uh, the increasing trend in mean monsoon and extreme rainfall. In both cases, uh, we can so you see the uh, increasing trend, which has been studied by uh, these authors. Okay. So now, why are we investigating the 2019 summer monsoon? What is special about this season? So this 2019 monsoon season was the strongest, strongest monsoon year since last uh, uh, 25 years, since the 1994. So in this year, AIMR, that is the All India Monsoon Rainfall, received 110% of uh, long period average rainfall as a whole. And uh, most of the meteorological subdivisions in Western Peninsula and the Western part of Central India recorded rainfall greater than 20% of the seasonal climatology. One striking feature of this uh, of this uh, seasonal uh, season, uh, season is that the prevalence of exceptional heavy rainfall events like floods and extreme rainfall events and landslides over the uh, western, uh, western part of the country uh, and the west coast. Interestingly, an extreme positive IOD event developed during the summer monsoon of 2019. So we will try to connect these heavy rainfall, uh, heavy rainfall events with the positive IOD uh, in our next course of talk. Indian Ocean Dipole is a significant mode of natural climate variability in the tropical Indian Ocean. And IOD can modulate the extreme rainfall activity over India by influencing the cross-equatorial moisture transport. Uh, in this figure by Ajay Mohan and Rao, they have shown that in the central Indian region of Ganga Mohanadi Basin, the extreme rainfall events are negatively and highly correlated, highly negatively correlated to the uh, sea surface temperature anomaly near the Java Sumatra coast. Java Sumatra coast, this is the cold pole of IOD. And also in 2011, Krishna et al. showed that the LPS-related rainfall gets increased over the whole east-west 
section of the Central India and Western India uh, during the positive IOD years. Okay. Based on this, we framed our science objective as understanding the coupled large-scale ocean atmospheric conditions favorable for development of organized convective systems in which, uh, which led to uh, persistent heavy precipitation over Western India during the 2019 summer monsoon. These are the data sets we used during the course of this study. First, we studied the interannual time series of uh, JJS dipole mode index, which is the indicator of the strength of Indian Ocean dipole, and the JJS rainfall anomaly over Western India. So from this figure, we can see that the intense positive IOD events, mostly the intense ones, those are associated with the high rainfall anomaly over Western India. This is the box of Western India we chose for our study. The most striking feature of this plot is that the 2019 year, the year of 2019, in this summer, the highest rainfall anomaly over Western India and the highest DMI occurred at the same time. Okay, so this is the plot of the seasonal outlook of the uh, 2019 monsoon. And from this plot, we can see that an extreme positive Indian Ocean dipole was uh, developing in the equatorial Indian Ocean. And also, uh, from the middle level uh, 600 HPA uh, picture, we can see that one anomalous cyclonic circulation was there uh, sitting over the Arabi northern Arabian Sea throughout the season. Next, we studied the subseasonal time series of normalized counts of station, uh, station, uh, st normalized station count of heavy rainfall incidences, heavy to extreme rainfall incidences. These are the categories in this plot. This is for the heavy rainfall. This is for the extremely heavy rainfall, uh, the very heavy, and this one is for extremely heavy rainfall. Okay. So we can uh, see here that uh, this uh, 2019 monsoon season uh, had three distinct intense rainfall episodes, which we call the IREs. And these IREs were, were uh, 28 June to 12 July. 24th July to 11th August, and 1st September to 14th September. For this study, we chose the threshold of 5% of stations, 5% of the uh, number of stations that reported the rainfall on a particular day, uh, greater than 64.5 millimeter. That is the heavy rainfall category defined by India Meteorological Department. And the initiation and termination of IREs were defined as the consecutive five days above threshold and below threshold, respectively. Next, we looked at the Weller anomalies, which is indicative of the uh, organized convection. We found that the uh, uh, northward propagating Weller anomalies and uh, northward propagating Weller anomalies just before the uh, intense uh, rainfall episodes, which we can see from uh, these two plots if we compare. And also those uh, extreme uh, those, uh, rainfall and those uh, Weller anomalies persisted during the IREs. Vertical profiles of latent heating is a very instrument, uh, is a good instrument uh, to look at the um, intense ra rainfall e episodes. So vertical profile can be classified into two categories uh, broadly, the convective and stratiform. The convective profile has a single metropospheric heating peak, whereas uh, the stratiform profile has upper level heating and lower level cooling. Climatologically, Western Ghat and Western India is a Western Ghat, mostly the windward side of the Western Ghat. It is a region of sh shallow convection. And from this figure, Sige et al., uh, Sige and Kumero 2016, they showed that uh, this region, which is the windward side of the Western Ghat, this is a region of shallow convection. And though the deep convective clouds can be seen over the Bay of Bengal region. Also, the stratiform precipitating deep clouds has been seen, uh, observed over Indian West Coast region during monsoon season, which has been studied by these authors. Next, if we look at the GPM DPR uh, surface rainfall estimates and the SLH latent heating profile from the GPM satellite, we can find that the surface rainfall, which is, uh, which is uh, the left panel, and the stratiform rain fraction, which is the right panel, 
the surface rainfall is mostly contributed by stratiform rainfall. And this right figure shows the vertical profile of latent heating from the SLH data. And here we can see that uh, the heating uh, from uh, the, this, the here the black line shows the mean, mean heating of the selected days, mean heating profile for the selected days during the IM. So this from the mean profile, we can see that there is a maxima at the middle level, uh, middle to upper level, uh, nearly at 400 h per. And there is a secondary maxima at the lower level, which come from the convective heating. But the most important thing is the upper level maxima, which is uh, basically from the top heavy heating and this uh, is the indicative of abundant stratiform precipitation during the IREs. Next, we studied the regression patterns of 2019 JJS uh, daily time series of heavy rainfall, which I showed earlier, that uh, bar plot. And we regressed that uh, time series over these quantities, like vorticity, relative vorticity, circulation, potential vorticity, uh, omega, etc. And if we look at the vorticity, uh, mid-level vorticity, 650 to 500 h per relative vorticity, and circulation, we can see that there was an extended band of, east-to-west -west extended band of relative vorticity and cyclonic circulation over the Indian subcontinent. It was also extending towards the South China Sea. And uh, along with it, also we studied that the 300, uh, 330k PV was also very high over this region. And the interesting thing is that during this uh, year is the maxima was over the Western Indian region. This high mid-level PV, uh, and uh, the, the, this, from this plot, we can see that high mid-level PV sets the environment for deep convection, which is evident from the strong ascent at mid-level. Next, uh, next, next, we can, uh, we can establish the linkage between IOD and deep convection uh, in 2019 season as follows. The positive IOD conditions that were developing during the JJS uh, season, it enhanced the cross-equatorial moisture transport and it depleted moisture from equatorial Indian Ocean and accumulated it towards the Indian subcontinent. It led to significant moisture convergence and organized convection over the e extensive, uh, extensive regions of South and Southeast Asia. And this resulted in the intense rainfall episodes. But one noticeable thing is that these intense rainfall episodes were not isolated. Those were not the events that, confi that were confined over the Western India alone, but they those have continental span throughout the uh, in South and Southeast Asia. I'm sorry. Okay. okay uh, now we can summarize our result like this. <laughs> Using the ground-based and satellite observations and reanalysis data sets, this study unraveled the large-scale ocean atmospheric uh, interconnections with the organization of convective systems over Western India in 2019 that caused the wettest monsoon over Maharashtra and Gujarat since 1901. This study highlights the impact of strong positive Indian Ocean dipole conditions on stratiform precipitating systems over South Asian monsoon region. And lastly, the considering the recurring monsoonal flood producing heavy to extreme rain events over Western Indian region in the recent years, this study provides a reliable framework for the heavy rainfall outlook suitable for this region. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Sunit. Okay. Any, any question? Only one yes, yes. Sure. Yeah, and you said the north of Pakistan was very active. Yes, sir. But why it was confined to only the western side, not eastern side? You mean the rainfall, heavy rainfall? No, no, no. North of Pakistan was uniform. Yeah, yeah. You have taken the average no, of Actually, it was not that much uniform, not north of Pakistan. But you have not shown the distinction between hmm. western and eastern you. side. Yes, sir. I'll show you. The yeah, average was right. 60 to 100 degrees, 65 mm -hmm. to 100 means yes. covering both. Yeah. But Going only western part was more rainfall. Mm -hmm. Eastern part was not that much. Mm -hmm. So my point. No, the rainfall was also high in the eastern part. Uh, comparatively, western India was. Uh, I mean, the extreme condition was over western okay. India. Rainfall was high. Eastern part there is drought in the India. Ha! If you are talking about the northern part of the region, India, ha, that was. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? No. So with this, we come to the end of the session. Thanks to all the speakers, as well as to organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much.
थैंक यू सर यू कैन ऑल प्रोसीड फॉर लंच एंड द नेक्स्ट सेशन वुड बी स्टार्टिंग एट टू थर्टी एंड दैट वुड बी सस्टेनिंग ग्रीन लाइफ एनर्जी सेशन ऑन एनर्जी थैंक यू just a moment uh, let me just freeze the screen तुम अपने ओपन करके रखो ना गेस्ट एज अ गेस्ट मेरा भी ओपन है कुछ नहीं करने हाँ मैं कर देता आपको मैं तो ओपन ही होगा ना दिक्कत तो नहीं है ये ओपन ही है कुछ करना हो तो कर लो अभी अभी तो सारी इंडस्ट्री वाले आ गए हैं क्या आदिल खान सारी इंडस्ट्री वाले आ गए एक ही तो आया है जब से एक डेस्कटॉप के फोल्डर है ट्रॉपमेट के नाम से जो इसमें ओपन है सब अच्छा